I'm muted. The whole intro is muted. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Art Jam. I'm Josh Herman, and this this is Alex Alvarez. Yeah. We are going to be making some stuff on stream today. Of course, this time I mute myself at the beginning. I think that's the first time that's ever happened. So I feel pretty good about like almost a year's <laughs> worth of streams with one mute start. <laughs> that is impressive. And <laughs> yeah, not too bad. Um, I am going to be sculpting a ZBrush today. I think I'm going to be starting a, another character with my cast of characters. Uh, awesome. And I think you said you might do some ZBrush stuff as well. Uh, I think not sure. so. I'm not, not totally sure. So, yeah. but uh, I mean, this week we don't have a, a guest. So that makes yeah, no it, guest. Cause it feels like it's like a work a week, like do whatever. Uh, it's like a, a free structured free play time kind of thing. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but uh, well, yeah, it was cool having guests though. Yeah. It's been fun to chat with everybody chatting with Crystal and Rodrigo and uh, in two weeks, not, not next week, but the following week, we'll have David Neal on. Uh, right. And he'll be doing some 2D character creation and character design stuff. So, so that'll be fun to chat about and and kind of awesome. work through. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm going to get my ZBrush up. I'll show you guys what I had started on or had done last week when we were working with uh, Rodrigo. I ended up taking this, this hammer that I built and I put it on this character. It's obviously not grasped right now. But I had built this android a couple weeks ago and then so mm -hmm. this is the uh hammer that i ended up doing last stream i kind of liked the some yeah, of the shapes cool. that were in there and so i figured it could be a nice accessory for this for this character yeah very and, cool and then i'm going to work on another couple of characters but yeah that's kind of what i'm going to jam on today uh, if you guys, well, in the chat, if any of you guys have questions on what we're working on or just general questions, please let us know. If any of us accidentally mute ourselves, please let us know. Or if there's issues with the video or anything, as always, I will try to fix it. But yeah, I think today we're just kind of jam out and work on some stuff. So I'm, I'm probably going to start from scratch or a base mess. I'm not super sure yet. All right, cool. That uh, acts for whatever reason made me think of uh, Godzilla versus Kong, which I watched last night. Have you seen oh, it? Oh yeah, I did. We watched it on Friday or Saturday. Yes. Okay. I what liked it. I thought it, I thought it was cool. I mean, I think anytime you have a big, uh, you know, kaiju style massive monster movie fighting, mm -hmm. I think it's always awesome. Yeah, it was it was impressive. Yeah. But I, I mean, I don't know. I, it, I I can only assume there were people in all those buildings. <laughs> there was definitely one moment where I think like Godzilla pushes Kong or vice versa, and like one of the buildings just like crumbled into like fine dust underneath it, and I was like, "Oh no!" I mean, like, the amount of buildings that were destroyed. So many, so yeah. many, and it then we <laughs> we watched uh, Pacific Rim last night as well. So I think we were just oh, kind wow. of in the in first that one? zone. Yeah, yeah, the first one. Yeah, and same kind of thing, just like so much stuff being destroyed uh that you're just like there's so much collateral damage in this it's insane yeah i have to see that one again i like that one i never saw the sequel though did you i did i wasn't a fan uh i just think the story wasn't it wasn't the same director but the story wasn't as as like tight i guess yeah. i don't know if it's the right word but also uh guillermo's style is just so specific yeah because story like, you know i mean it's like in these movies godzilla versus kong story made no sense whatsoever <laughs> yeah i think i mean likely most other people's least favorite mm -hmm. parts but definitely my least favorite part was the humans oh yeah I just i just want to see more godzilla i want to see more kong uh yeah i mean i didn't quite understand what the purpose of any of the characters were in the movie <laughs> like what were they doing what was their motivation where did they come from why are they there sure yeah you know like why is millie bobby brown in this movie who is she why does she seem to have some sort of authority why does she seem to have some kind of knowledge and involvement in this i don't get it yeah yeah i mean it was not my favorite part of the film but Kong was Kong was amazing and Godzilla was amazing. Yeah, they looked great. They were super yeah. cool. They were they had a lot of had some crazy there. creatures. Yeah. It was it was rough. Yeah. I did like the um the way they ended it. I'm not gonna spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it, but I did like the way that yeah, it was me ended. Too. Me too. Yeah, no, it was a super entertaining movie. Yeah. So 
Yeah, I wish I had a bigger bigger screen here. I'm in Joshua Tree and the TV's kind of small, so I have to watch yeah. it uh, on something bigger or mm -hmm. maybe in a real movie theater one day. Yeah, um, Jared and Kyle uh, both posted on their Instagrams. I think they went to see it together in a theater, so it sounds like theaters are opening right. back up, which is exciting. Yeah. yeah, that is exciting. Yeah, I mean, I'm only, I guess at this point, one week away from technically being, you know, sure. Like two week point past the second shot so that's awesome yeah same i think i'm about a week away week from tomorrow yeah so that'll be that'll be good um so we would want to see what the, the babies of godzilla and kong would look like that's definitely an interesting <laughs> i don't know if they're compatible but you know that'd be interesting sure uh yeah <laughs> well, i'm sure it made a lot of money so there'll be more Oh yeah, there will definitely be more. I would expect that there will absolutely be more of those. For sure. All right, I'll get you up on this as well. We'll do this. Let's do this layout today. Yeah, look, speaking oh, of. Speaking of. That's funny. Oh, I don't know if that's I like the their one. I like their screensavers, though. All the stuff that ZBrush is putting in there. Yeah, the screensaver I'm not crazy about. I don't mind it every now and then. It just takes over your screen. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind it. It kind of like comes in and just, yeah, yeah, yeah. is what it is. But I, it's it's kind of nice to see some artwork that I wouldn't expect, which is cool. Uh, true, I agree. Finding something like, oh, I've never seen this before. That's cool. It's, and then uh let's see a bunch of people starting to filter in um oh it looks like adam uh one of our recruiters is here You're showing off today's rtm to high school live hello hello, hello adam that's awesome yeah today we're sculpting in zbrush so i'm starting to make a head and i think uh alex is getting his setup ready as well so uh, mm -hmm. yeah follow think... along or pop back yeah, this is what I where I got yeah. to last week. So I just uh, took this character that I made on the stream last month, mm -hmm. which then on my own time added a body to. And then last week, uh, from Sue through Mixamo and got him animated and then uh, just blocked this scene together. Walking just with some bunch of my photogrammetry scans. That's what all these are. And so scans of cliff faces and scans of rocks. Um, and then uh, rendered it out. So I think at the end of last week, I had it. Let's see. I think this is the file, which is where I got it to at the end of the stream. So open with. So I just had this kind of moody dude walking in the fog. So, mm -hmm. and then I rendered this during the stream. So obviously it's pretty noisy because I rendered it with really low settings just to be able to render 150 frames right. in 10 minutes. Um, and, then, uh, and then I played with it a little bit more over the weekend. And so, which uh, if I go over here, the final should be, I think this guy. I don't know if you hear my system audio, but we'll see. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How'd you do that fire? Is that Embergen? Uh, I started with Embergen and then realized that I actually have a library that I got forever ago of like fire loops. And so I just stuck a little fire loop that I had and tracked it onto a, a little point above his head. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I got to play with the After Effects tracker, which I hadn't really uh, used. Yeah. And uh, then I made it as a loop. So it's like he's animated at uh, 24 frames per second but then, and Maya, but then I put it to 12 frames per second just to slow it down. And mm -hmm. then I wanted to make something that was going to be loopable. So while it's not looping, does this player loop? Oh, it does. So when it gets to the end,
Yeah. So it'll just play forever because it, it's been a little while, but I have like framed computer monitors at home where like mm -hmm. I've taken computer monitors and put proper like wooden frames around them and uh, hang them on the wall connected to like a, like a Mac mini. Mm -hmm. And so I can have uh, looping wall art. And so, uh, so I just wanted to make this guy a loop. And so if I go into Maya, the main thing is just making sure that the animation is looping. Mm -hmm. And then the, if there's gonna be a camera move, the camera move needs to loop as well. So I just did the camera pushing in and then zooming back out. So when it gets to frame 336, then it's just going to loop back. Thanks. And so, and with something like a walk cycle, it's easy to make those loop because we can see that the animation on this guy from Mixamo, was only like 28 frames long, but then I doubled it to 56 just to slow him down a little bit. And then in Maya, if you have something that's animated already, if you go to the graph editor in Maya, you can select all the curves and just go to post infinity cycle. And it'll basically take whatever animations on an object and then cycle it indefinitely, hmm. which is cool. And forever, so yeah. that's cool forever. And so that basically, even though he only has 56 uh, keyframes on him, he is going to just loop forever. And so that's kind of cool. And then I needed to render it out. And uh, and I wanted to render it at full HD. And uh, so I thought I'd play with the uh, online render farm for the first time. So that was Oh, yeah. Cool. What'd you use? Uh, I used Rebus for the first time, and nice. uh, which is what a lot of our students have been using. Yeah, for yeah. the ones who are using Redshift, the ones who are using V-Ray are using uh, Chaos. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Justin's in here. What's up, Justin? Justin, happy uh, birthday or belated. Ah, oh, happy birthday. So yeah, with Rebus, it's super simple. Like in my interface now, right here, it says Rebus Farm. And so uh, basically when you make an account with Rebus, it installs, you download a Maya plugin. And then once you have the Maya plugin, you'll just get a little menu. And then if I want to render something, you know, obviously you do all your render tests locally to make sure everything's cool and your render globals as far as the frame rate and the file format. And uh, and then under uh, Rebus Farm, if I go to render setup, then I get this little pop-up that appears. Mm -hmm. And then I can choose the priority as far as how much, uh, like if I say the standard, which is the cheapest, it's going to take two hours to launch the render. Okay. If I go up to high priority, it'll be more expensive, but it'll start rendering almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And then basically you just, if I do a quick check, then it checks my scene to make sure it looks normal. So like it's giving me a warning saying, hey, your right. Y resolution is very high because I'm rendering something vertical. So I guess it mm -hmm. sees that as being weird. Mm -hmm. And then it checks your textures and render settings or whatever. And then if I click render now, it'll upload uh, everything to their servers uh, meaning your models, textures, everything. So that was the only like slowdown is that Upload. my internet isn't very fast here. Mm -hmm. And so it took like this file is about 1.5 gigs because it's kind of heavy models with like a bunch of 4K and 8K textures and EXR displacements and whatever. Not so much for the character, but just all these photogrammetry assets. Mm -hmm. So it took like an hour to upload, upload because my render upload time here yeah or upload speed is internet fantastic. yeah but if i had rendered it locally on this computer it would have taken about eight hours to render just because i like crank the render settings and sure. um, i'm rendering at You're 2k good. and whatever and it's you know 336 frames and once it's got uploaded to their server rendered in an hour hour and a half so that was Pretty cool quick. so i thought that was awesome and then uh so yeah, I think I'm going to be using more of that just because, you know, buying another machine to render on would be nice and everything, but you can't buy a graphics card. <laughs> <laughs> right, especially now. Yeah. <laughs> They're like out yeah. of stock everywhere, which is freaking nuts. So even though it, is, it costs yeah. money to render with Rebus, so we get like a 70% discount, which um, is awesome uh, for us, for our students. And then, uh, although I think Rebus is doing that, you know, for all students and all schools everywhere. Um, uh, I actually recently saw them having a promotion of like, if you're rendering with a GPU renderer, like Redshift or Octane, that uh, they're doing like a global 70% discount for a little while. Cool. So yeah, so it's cool. So I was able to, I rendered it once, realized that I forgot that I had animated the focal plane for the depth of field on this guy. So I forgot to loop that. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had to re-render it, which I have, if I had rendered local locally, I wouldn't have discovered that until 10 hours later. But by rendering it on the cloud right. an hour later, I'm like, oh, crap. Shoot, yeah. So yeah, so basically uh, he came out of here uh, not looking like this. And I brought it into After Effects just to do like color stuff. And then I used uh, this program Audition for the first time. Oh, cool, yeah. Because you know, like creative, if I go into my creative cloud, and let this wake up. There are like so many programs in here when you have like the full subscription, you know, so really? you just like Photoshop and After Effects, you're just like, I'm just opening this just as, because it's funny. You know, it's like, there's so many programs that are part of your suite hmm. that, you know, and so a lot of them have come out, you know, in the last few years where, you know, I just don't know what they, like, what's Prelude? I don't know. Like Animate, Animate what? I don't know, I use Maya. You know, like there's all these things. So there was Audition. And I was like, what's Audition? And Audition's just like they're like a sound program, like Pro Tools or Logic or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not really so much for music, but I downloaded it and it's super, super simple, super cool. And so, uh, you so I exported music, right? What's that? Did you do make the music yourself? Yeah, I did all the sound for, for that. Nice. And so here, let me uh, launch this. So basically with Audition, just like Pro Tools or whatever, like you can import video. So I exported the video as an H.264 movie file from uh, After Effects that I then imported in here. Let's see, let's open. And this is before I did the final color grading on it. So that's why it looks kind of black and white. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know if you, it sounds like you hear my system audio. Yeah, we hear it. Are you hearing it through my microphone or through the computer? Uh, mute your mic and we'll see. Your microphone. Yeah, it's going through your, yeah. Did, did you hear it when I muted my microphone? microphone? No. Oh, it, it turned off the audio? Yeah. Oh, that sucks. So you're hearing it kind of weird quality because you're hearing it through my uh, A little my, bit. Oh. How do I share my system audio? Uh, you'd have to share it when you click the share screen option. There's a share audio, but that might share me talking to you as well, which might be weird. Oh, uh, yeah. So you play with that. Yeah, we got to figure yeah. out a way so you, you can do your sound stuff and then, yeah, that'd be cool. That's awesome. You did the, yeah. the, the sound and the everything for it. So, yeah, like in here, you can see like all the sound that I did. So, like, I if I just start with, uh, like I started with his footsteps, so if I solo that track. Mm -hmm. So I just grabbed, a, I have a sample library, so I grabbed a sample of a bunch of explosions and then just took those explosion sounds, pitch shifted them down so they're lower and then stretched them out so they last longer. And so, and then basically that's kind of what those became. And so, which is, uh, I think if I go in here, go to this file, that's the original sound. Is that like somebody hitting a trash can? What is that? It's just a regular, it's just called urban explosion spot. It does okay. sound like somebody hitting a, a trash can. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like somebody hitting like one of those big uh, newspaper bins, just like, doosh. that's what it sounds like to me. And then, uh, so yeah, I started with that. And then like, I've got this little uh, like harbor industrial din, which is just the sound of like a harbor that I slowed down. And then let's see, what else did I do in here? Got some uh, like mechanical sounds that I slowed down and pitch shifted. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I played some stuff on the keyboards back here. And so I got uh, one sound that's on the uh, Nord, which is like this drone that's just sort of mm -hmm. playing. And then this guy, I got it on the sound that I used. Oh yeah. Okay. 
so yeah, it was super fun. Like I hadn't like made sort of music and sound effects to video in a while, so that was like really fun to do. Awesome. So yeah, I played with audition. X what's that? Full package of everything. Oh. So that's audition. And then after effects is where I did the final grading. Mm -hmm. So I uh, upgraded my license of Red Giant because I've used Red Giant software for a long time, specifically Magic Bullet, which is their color grading suite. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Red Giant got acquired by Maxon. Right. So who makes Cinema 4D and acquired Redshift. And so now basically you can buy like a full license via Maxon for... You can get everything, which includes Redshift and Cinema 4D, or you can have something that just has like all their sort of like grading and effects, like After Effects type plugins. And mm -hmm. so I just got that suite. Um, Somebody says he was, uh, had some John Carpenter vibes. Totally, yeah. <laughs> The uh, like the OB6 synth, which is like this guy up here, as is just a amazing, very 80s sounding yeah. synth. And, and as soon uh, as you played a couple things, I was like, oh, that's so nostalgic. Oh. Like I know exactly. Yeah. Halloween. Although that's not the right sound for it. <laughs> but. Uh, that was one of the first things I learned how to play on the piano was the Halloween. I think I remember you saying that, yeah. And then I learned Exorcist, of course. <laughs> Which is actually Mike Goldfield. <laughs> but yeah, here's an... Uh, uh after effects and so basically in here let me just check which comp i'm on yeah that's that one so if i select the dude and let's just sort of slow this down and let's go to him so this is pretty much what it came like looking out of maya so just basically black and white oh, okay and deal with color in there and then uh and here i just used some of the red giant so under effects you know i've got all these red giant plugins and so i use one called mojo and one called looks mm -hmm. and the looks uh plugin is really really cool it's just got a lot of presets um and uh so if i go in here and edit it's like a color, color grading suite, but it's got a million presets that you can use as a start point, which is really cool. So if I go inside here and I go under looks, you'll see on the left a very long list of presets. Mm -hmm. So for people who are used to like Instagram filters like everybody is now or Snapchat or whatever, you know, like all of that stuff comes from the fact that people have been grading photos and video and film forever. And then that kind of came to the public via these filters on social media. Mm -hmm. But things like Magic Bullet, you know, or Lightroom, you know, like there's there's just all these uh, presets. And so it's awesome to basically go through and, you know, you can get a lot of inspiration for different ideas of how you can color your work. So yeah. I think it's important for people that are new to 3D to, you know, just know that what where you get to with your render in maya or whatever program you're using using your render engine doesn't have to be where it stops you know that you can go in photoshop or after effects or nuke and just sort of keep playing and uh and come up with a lot of different ideas of how you can stylize your your work to get a bunch of different looks and so ultimately even though my maya render is grayscale you know like i can just through you know color tweaking and post you know do what i need mm -hmm. to do from a color perspective so and then this tool basically is like a node-based uh color tool and so mm -hmm. if i go in here and uh and pick one of these presets you'll see at the bottom what it's doing so you can see how it built this effect and so it's doing you know spot exposure um and so with any one of these we can see that it's colorizing, it is applying curves like in Photoshop and a little bit of color control. And so something like the spot exposure, if I move it around, you can see that it's basically brightening wherever that mm -hmm. little ring is. 
And so it's just brightening the center. And so I could go and modify that, change it. And the nice thing of being in After Effects is that it's all non-destructive and it all right. works on you know your video or animation. So, so basically yeah, I've got the magic bullet looks adding the color and then I found this uh, cool plugin called uh, Heatwave. I've done this kind of things with displacements before, like 2D displacements. But this Heatwave plugin, which is part of Magic Bullet, uh, adds like a heat ripple effect. And so if we go in here and I lower the quality down, and let's preview a small range. But you can kind of see in the image, there's a slight rippling happening. Let me zoom in a little bit. I don't know if you can see that there's a, a ripple. Yeah, you can kind of see saturate. the distortion, like kind of like on the, the whole image. Yeah, like if I put yeah. the heat intensity to 100, it's a 20. And yeah, I yeah. Re, And I rebring that back in. Now it's pretty oh, obvious. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. So, but that's obviously too strong. So I just put a little bit of heat ripple in the lower left corner of the image um, using that guy, which I just thought added a nice little atmospheric effect to it. And uh, like it. that's kind of cool. And then I got this uh, lens flare from the Null Light Factory. And the Null Light Factory has been around for a really long time as like a lens flare suite, and uh, which also has uh, a lot of presets and a lot of control. So this little lens flare we see above his head is coming from that plugin. Mm -hmm. And I just have it tracked. And so that's, uh, if we go to Null Light Factory, and let's see, and I go into Designer. So as with Red Giant looks, like there's a, it's basically a system for designing lens flares, which is pretty cool. So it's got all these presets that are popping up on the left. Mm -hmm. And this is from John Null, uh, who is obviously famous for creating Photoshop with his brother. And uh, so he's been at ILM for years and he's now a visual effects supervisor. And so he created this long time ago. So there's a lot of iconic lens flares like you know, a photon torpedo and stuff like that that uh, were developed you know, uh, by him and by ILM. So it's got all these presets, pretty cool. And you can basically just take any one of these presets and see what they look like. But then as with the red giant on the right, you can see the lens flare editor. And so these are all of the nodes you can use to design a lens flare on the right. Mm -hmm. And then basically cool. the lens flare preset that I'm currently using right here on the lens flare editor, I can see what's actually being combined to create this specific look. So you can see if I move it around. So, and let's go and get this guy. What was the, the lens flare plugin called again? This is uh, the Knoll, K-N-O-L-L, -L, uh, Light Factory. And it's from Red Giant Software. And uh, so yeah, so if I grab any one of these, then basically here, let's see. Let me get this to zoom in a little bit. Because uh, for some reason, scale doesn't seem to be working correctly. But that's OK. I'm not going to worry about that. So you kind of design your lens flare and then, uh, and it's again, all non-destructive. So if I go in here and I hide all of the elements that are building this, you can see that I can like hide or show that little glow that's on the lens flare or this little circle that's in the lower left corner. Mm -hmm. And as with any lens flare, you know, as it moves, it's behaving correctly to a camera because with real world cameras, the rings of a lens flare always go through the center of an image. Uh, it has to do with the optics of a real lens. It has different pieces of glass, and it's basically your light source kind of reflecting off of each piece of glass that's inside mm -hmm. a lens. And so, yeah, so I had that little guy inside here. And then I had to track it so that it would sort of stay on top of his head. And so for that, I rendered, let's see, that is, I think, this dude. Yeah. 
I rendered uh, this element. Hang on, let me just go and bring that out separately. My project, that's going to be my tracker. So you can see this little dot, which if I hit play, it's a little dot that I tracked. You can see it's sort of moving around. Mm -hmm. I rendered that out from Maya. So I just put like a tiny little sphere above his head in Maya, yeah. rendered that out as a separate pass. And so it's basically moving where I want it to be. And then After Effects has a tracker. So you can see this is me just sort of tracking that little dot. That dot, yeah. Yeah. And then... Uh, All right. Just make it easy to follow one separate object versus like trying to capture something in the whole in the image and having issues and makes sense exactly so yeah so that's how i got and then in the lens flare uh if i go into the lens flare and go to my effects then in no light factory you can specify the location layer and so you can mm -hmm. assign that to like a track point and then the lens flare will basically lock onto that track point. I could also have exported 3D data for Maya. Like you can export 3D cameras and lights and locators and stuff like that in 3D space. But I haven't done that in After Effects before. So, I, but I did know how to do it this way. So that way it might be faster. But the tracker in After Effects is pretty fast. And then, uh, and then I wanted that little flame on top. And so for that, I just put that onto the same track point. And uh, that's a little track or a little element that's a loop. And so if I go in here and I find that, yeah, that's that. That's this dude. Mm -hmm. Oops. So yeah, just a little looping fire loop. So I could have. I actually started making this number gen, mm -hmm. and then uh, just remembered that I had this loop on my hard drive already, and so I ended up using this and so otherwise as you know from seeing ember gem on the streams this mm -hmm. is probably the easiest thing you could make in ember gem <laughs> yeah, it's like the default thing that that it loads <laughs> yeah. with yeah uh so i just decided in the end uh you know what would be cool would be obviously to take an animated object from maya in, into ember gen like that little white dot if mm -hmm or that little sphere that I had in Maya, if I could export that animated object to Ember Gen and have that emit fire so it's moving correctly as his body moves, that'd be rad. But again, Ember Gen doesn't support importing animated objects yet. Right. Um, Not yet. Were they, you, I feel like you were saying they were getting, like so they, that's, they're still working on that. Supposedly that's gonna be in the next uh, release, which right. they said end of Q1, which we're now in Q2, so hopefully soon. Yeah. And then, uh, so yeah, and then I put that onto the same track point. And, uh, and then, so if I go into my effects control, so that's the no light factory. Um, and then I've got a, like a little noise uh, plugin called Renoiser, which is also part of uh, Magic Bullet. And Renoiser simply just adds noise. So if I go in here and I go to, let's say full at 100%, then you perhaps can see that it's just adding a little bit of grain onto the image mm -hmm. just to tie it all together and make it look like it's a little older. Not really necessary, but... And the cool thing with the Renoiser plugin is that it allows you to control where the noise goes based on value. So I can have like less noise in the highlights and more noise in the shadows and stuff like that. And then uh, after I did that stuff, I then took the comp and put it and sort of bake the comp into a new comp, which is this one. And then in this comp, I added, a, let's see, is that the one that I added it? No, it's not in that one. Oh, I did it as an adjustment layer. On this adjustment layer, I added some more effects. I added some camera shake, mm -hmm. some glow, and uh, this is actually where I chose to do the noise. So the camera shake, if I turn it off, and we render this out. The only thing my camera was doing in Maya was it was just it was slowly moving in and then moving out. Right. Um, but I wanted it to have a little shake on it because when I posted this on Instagram after our stream, I filmed mm -hmm. my screen with my phone, like I just shot video of yeah, yeah. and that created like a little bit of a wobble because of me holding my phone. Mm -hmm. And I kind of liked how that looked. 
which I could obviously add Camera Shake and Maya on the actual camera, but it's really easy to do it with another plugin that's just called Camera Shake, mm -hmm. um, which is also part of the Universe Red Giant suite. And so with that on inside here, if I render this little region, instead of the camera just pushing in and pulling out, you can kind of see that the camera has a little bit of side to side wobble on it. Mm -hmm. It's just a little bit of camera shake. Uh, I've then, got a question. Do you use Nuke very often or, or just Adobe stuff in this? Uh, I find myself using After Effects more for personal stuff. I've used Nuke, um, and Nuke is amazing. And uh, But I've used After Effects for so long that I just, uh, I think it has to do with the complexity of what you're doing. Like, this is very simple. Right. It doesn't have a lot of layers. And so therefore, like you can see in the lower left corner that my project only has seven layers. So like layers in Photoshop, they stack, and you can end up with a really long list of layers. And so if you think about a Photoshop comp that has 500 layers, it becomes a pain to manage. Yeah. And so you can, put, yeah. you can put things in groups, but then like things are nested in groups and groups are in groups and it's hard to find stuff. And so that's why in the visual effects industry, especially on like, you know, uh, in film where you might have hundreds of elements, each element might be rendered with 20 passes per element where you could end up literally with you know a thousand, two thousand nodes. Mm -hmm. um, seeing that in a layer stack is hard to read, and yeah. but seeing it in a node view is easier. And so that's why Nuke is much more popular for complex compositing in the visual effects space. But for personal work where I just have a few things, I find that After Effects is just easier to set up. It imports PSDs. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been using After Effects since before Adobe owned it. Oh. So my first license of After Effects was for COSA After Effects. So COSA was a software company that originally made it, and then Adobe bought it. I think Adobe bought I don't know if Adobe ever developed anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think they bought everything. <laughs> I mean, they developed stuff after buying it. Sure, but, yeah. You know, like, kind of funny. Yeah, that's interesting. Has Adobe awesome. After Effects added significant improvements as of late? I'm not a power user for After Effects by any stretch of the imagination, so it's hard for me to really intelligently talk about After Effects, to be honest. I can just do basic compositing. So, you know, I'm I'm sure that they've added cool stuff, but it, I might not be the, the target audience. Right. And so I think that's, you know, I use it for what I need, which is just, like, I would do this in Photoshop if I could. It's just... You know, Photoshop's support of video isn't all that great because generally I do my compositing for stills in Photoshop while I know some people composite their stills in Nuke, which to me mm -hmm. seems a little bit like overkill um, because Photoshop now supports 32-bit compositing. So I hope Adobe will not buy Autodesk. Uh, <laughs> you know, I like... Adobe as a company better than Autodesk as a company. So I would say if Adobe bought Autodesk, that would be way better than Autodesk buying Adobe. In the inverse. Yeah, that's probably, I would probably go. I would. I think I would agree with you there. <laughs> yeah. But Autodesk is pretty massive, so I don't see Adobe. I think Adobe would rather just develop their own 3D tools, which is what they've been doing by buying Substance, a yep. logarithmic. Yep. Adobe is clearly entering the 3D game. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I got my camera shake, a little bit more color that I just used to just darken the foreground. And then finally I added this neat little plugin called uh, UniGlow, which if I add a new, let's see if I can find it. It's under, there it is. I think I saw it. UniGlow. Yeah, so it's this guy. So you can see it's a little intense with its default settings. Mm -hmm. um, but it basically is like, if I hit play, see how it's kind of got this cool animation on it? Mm -hmm. So I basically took that and toned it down. And so you actually don't really notice it so much. But I timed that glow coming on to when the sort of sun was popping up from behind the dude. Mm -hmm. Here, let me uh, there, stretch it yeah. out a little bit. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. 
so it's kind of adding this kind of like flary vibe but it's pretty subtle like in the lower left corner you can see it just popped mm -hmm. up nice little detail though so once this is done buffering mm -hmm. so it's just this like little thing that's cool I'm going to try this picture in picture. Somebody was saying it might be better to have the screen bigger when we're seeing those. So, so now this is in the way. Picture in picture? Yeah, it's a different layout. We were doing this layout. Oh, Makes right. the screen a little bigger. Yeah, I mean, I'm on a 30-inch uh, monitor, which makes all the text a little small. So, yeah, if anybody can't see something I'm talking about, just let me know, and I can I can explain it yeah. better. Yeah, or I can uh, full size the screen or whatever too. Um, but yeah, that's basically uh, you know just this little little loop, which is kind of was fun because it's been a while since I've done something like this. So and uh, yeah, so now to make something new. Well, you had several questions during that. I didn't want to interrupt too much, but the number one question that came up early: mm -hmm. NFT question mark. <laughs> maybe maybe probably not it sounds like maybe um i mean i've been i the last few days i've been definitely like going down the rabbit hole of uh sure. nfts here i'll get this to be buffering i'm just gonna turn off the audio yeah, um nice. and uh yeah i mean i got an invite to foundation from furio and then i mm -hmm. uh made an account on super rare and maker's place and mm -hmm. just started looking around and looking at the artists and discovered a lot of art that I hadn't seen before because the space is so different than what you see on art station. Yeah. Um, and so it's been cool just to see new art, you know, especially like there's so much animated stuff because the motion graph graphics community is big in the NFT space. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've been enjoying just looking at what people are posting. I think it's motivated a lot of artists to make new stuff. And Agreed. that's yeah. cool because I think anything that makes people be creative is positive. The idea that it's negative for people to sell stuff and make money is crazy. Artists have been supporting themselves by selling their art uh, for eons, you know, and it's very, and it's always been impossible for digital artists to do anything other than trying to sell a print for 20 bucks where everybody knew the print wasn't the original. And therefore, how are you going to make any money on it? Right. So anybody that thinks that the NFT thing is bad is nuts because it's amazing that artists like people are making money i mean it's right. like come on he's a 3d guy you know he's been right. in the scene forever doing motion graphics doing animation making stills doing personal work it's so cool that he made all that money i'd much prefer him getting millions of dollars than like some abstract you know painter who just like spits paint on a wall and i can't tell what it is and they make millions of dollars you know right. so like i think it's cool that Raphael and Vitali and all these people are making money. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Maybe. You know, now obviously the only negative is like, you know, there there's concerns about the energy uses. And yeah, I, I obviously am concerned about that too. And I hope they get that resolved. But the principle in general, I think is cool. So mm -hmm. you know, I whether I end up doing NFTs, I don't know. I mean at some point, you know, but I I definitely thanks to Gnome and don't make personal work for money. I just do it for, for fun and, and, uh, for that, that purpose. So luckily I have, I have a, a job that gives me some time to be able to do that sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, what are our opinions on blender? I think Blender's cool. Yeah, definitely. I think Blender's awesome. I think blender is the, the best free 3d program out there with the best community if you want to get into 3d it's a good good program to learn and if you want to even explore and keep pushing different types of 3d i think that they've got some really innovative things i think that's something that's interesting is that they're really innovating for um like on the modeling and texturing and viewport like they're doing a lot of cool stuff there that that i think some of the bigger packages are focusing on other parts of the pipeline so yeah. uh it's a cool space to to check that out, and it's a yeah, good there's program. So many cool tools coming out for it that people are sharing. Yeah. Just like the, it's so progressive compared to what we're used to seeing with software development. 
Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think anytime there's something new, it's great. And it's been around for a long time. It's really just the last couple of years. I feel like it just hit some milestone in, in the feature set that allowed it to produce, you know, more professional looking work. And so a bunch of professionals started jumping onto it. I think the viewport is what it was. Once the viewport yeah. kind of got to a, because that's when I saw you know, the concept community really came onto it. But like when the viewport came to a point mm -hmm. where it was like, oh, like it's rendering really well now too. And it's, it's you know, basically live. You're like, okay, like now all the other, all the other cool modeling, like there's been great and cool modeling tools and things like that, you know, things like Moto and Silo and other old programs that did that. But as soon as the viewport was, was uh, you didn't have to get it out of Blender anymore. I think that was a huge, huge stepping point for it. Yeah. No, it's uh, so we'll see where it all goes and where you know Maya, twenty twenty two has a lot of really cool features. You know, it's uh, it still has this port that looks like this, so it obviously doesn't right. look all you know pretty, but you know the support of uh, the USD file format. Mm -hmm. And its ability, it's it's like a whole new sort of proxy caching system that handles massive scenes really, really well. So that's a big step towards Maya's viewport performance once people start developing USD format or uh, workflows in Maya. But yeah, I wish the viewport looked prettier than this. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm used to it because I've been using Maya. You know, somebody just asked what was my first version Maya of Maya uh, Alpha three. So, which was probably before beta, beta, before release, yeah. Yeah, because I was working for Alias when they were developing it. So I was a power animator support guy, but then they were developing Maya. Right. So I think uh, I started using Maya about two years before it came out. So that was like 96, wow. something like that. Yeah, Wavefront days. So, and uh, so yeah, I know some people are like, well, you know, it's uh, Maya's getting long in the tooth. And it's like, yeah, but it's got an amazing feature set and a lot of artists are used to it. They just need to resolve a few issues, you know, and I'm sure they're aware of Blender. I'm sure they're aware of what's going on with Unreal. You know, I mean, they partner and work with Epic regularly on stuff, so. Right. Yeah, do you know, may, maybe in two years, we'll all be using Blender. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Somebody asked about Cinema 4D. I've never used Cinema 4D. Okay. Um, it's big in the, it used to be big in the matte painting world. And then, uh, because it had a lot of really good projection tools. And then it became really big in the motion graphics community, which it still is. And so a lot of motion graphics artists love it. Um, it's got a lot of great tools for replicating and animating replicate replica uh, replicated objects and instancing and you know Maya now has mash mm -hmm. and so the mash tool set is uh, kind of an answer to that which is pretty powerful so I think cinema 4d is great I mean they're all cool you know what, whatever 3d program clicks with your brain that you love using I'd say that is perfectly fine Use you know that. the issue is is getting a job mm -hmm. You know, like if you want to be a motion graphics artist, it makes sense to use Cinema 4D. If you want to work, a, you know, as a cinematics artist at, you know, Blur or Blizzard, you probably want to use Maya. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to, it, it really just like look at the studio you want to work at and see, uh, find out what tools they're using because, right. you know, like character rigging is so different between, let's say, Houdini and Maya. Mm -hmm. So knowing how to rig in one doesn't mean you can just jump into the other one and start rigging right away. So if you want to be a character rigger at ILM, it would make sense to learn like, well, what what tool are they using? Right, absolutely. Yeah. And I still don't have the scroll wheel for chat, so unfortunately, really, I can't. Yeah. yeah, it might work. Maybe it's because I. I'm like a moderator or admin or something. Uh, some earlier questions that we had that that were Nomen related, I guess. Um, have campus has campus opened up yet, or will it all be online? Was the first question. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what we got. The NFT question. Let's see. 
Is it going to be Beta Ray Bill, the character that I'm working on? Yes, I was just deciding to just start sculpting Beta Ray Bill. Um, and that's basically it. So I guess the question about the Noman campus uh, for the upcoming term uh, is still going to be online. It's just to get an answer it shortly, but uh, yeah, we're still kind of having to deal with the regulations and rules of all the accrediting agencies and make sure that everything can be rolled out safely. Pretty yeah, quick. so spring term starts what, in like a, a week? Uh, next week. Next week. Yep, next week will be our first week of classes, so. Yeah, so I mean, obviously we're still in shut down in California in many ways. I think I just read that uh, the state announced that they want everything to reopen in June. Is that mm -hmm. what I read? I think I've heard something like that, yeah. So we don't know what that means about universities and colleges. And so we're obviously, we want to open as soon as it's safe to do so. But obviously next week is too soon. So right. maybe summer. Open. So maybe summer term will, you know, I, I doubt we'd be fully open. I don't think back to normal is happening that quickly. Right. But at least uh, some people on campus cross fingers. Mm -hmm. Have you sculpted that whole dude while I was looking at my screen? <laughs> I sculpted his head. I oh. sculpted his head, and then I sculpted. Uh, I brought in a base mesh of of a okay. bigger muscular dude. I and uh, I did that cast. Oh, uh, where is it? No, no, I didn't. I did not do all of them that quickly. Uh, where did they go? Let's see. Oh, it's back. Uh, are we live? Somebody's asking from YouTube. Yes, we are. Hello. Hope mm -hmm. you're doing well. If you got any questions or uh, let us know. Happy to answer things. Where'd they go? Oh, yeah. So I had sculpted this one. At first, I was doing like a little lion. I was like, maybe like a little. I don't know if, if you've ever read Invincible, but there's a character named Battle Beast, who's one of my favorite uh, comic book characters in a long time. Uh, and so I was kind of mimicking this. And so this is that cast of characters I had sculpted, like this kind of rough body shape for this character to kind of get them all in a cast. And I even put that sword that I made last week with like this character to start like identifying who would do what or who would go with what. So this was the body sans the head that I sculpted uh, just sometime last weekend. Uh, and so I just tossed it in here to, to work on this character and, change the proportions a little bit, make them a little more leaner, a little more monstery, kind of go from there. Very cool. Yeah. I'm using the uh, substance, not the substance, the Sculptress Pro feature. I've been using that more in in ZBrush. And yeah. so what you can, what's cool about it is, we'll go like this way. Aha, it worked. Um, what you can, what's cool about the, the Sculptress Pro feature is this is what the mesh itself looks like. Yeah. So you can start with a pretty low definition mesh and just sculpt in the features that you want. Like if you don't, I don't really want to res this whole area like here up because mm -hmm. I don't need to, you know, but if I just want to sculpt in a quick feature, like I can grab this, it's just this little button here. And so it's based on the size of your brush. And so if it's really tiny, you can just, even though the mesh is there, you can just sculpt that line in. And if it's really big, it actually changed all the geometry around it. You can kind of see it'll like simplify the whole thing. Yeah, that's trippy. It's interesting. But for details, like, you know, if I want to just add a quick little detail here, mm -hmm. uh, I can just kind of carve in some lines. And I don't have to deal with remeshing. I don't have to deal with any of that. So for like getting an idea out, it's really great for blocking out a quick and simple shape and then saying like, okay, cool. Like I just want to, I just want to detail this eye, you know, or just add a little a little wrinkle here, and I'm done. Like I, I can I can move on to right. kind of flesh the idea out. It's really really great for that. So I've been using Which, that. Quite a bit. How do you choose between using Sculptress and Dynamesh? Uh, Sculptress is just this little button. So Dynamesh is. No, one but I mean app personally, app. like why use Sculptress mm -hmm. as opposed to Dynamesh? With Dynamesh, like so, like here I'll just duplicate the mesh. Uh, duplicate this and we'll just kind of 
what you what I find at least is I am having to do more work. So like this is on a 64 projection. I've using the project feature and they added a couple of versions ago the sub projection, which mm -hmm. makes it so that when you project these corners are getting more detail. Uh, so it's not doing like if I turn this off and just do it, it's just wrapping it. Right, but the mm -hmm. the project feature adds those little corners to it. Uh, so, what if I were to try to get this level of detail? I would probably have to be at like right now. It's at sixty four. I'd probably have to be like five hundred. Mm -hmm. The currently the mesh is five hundred fifty thousand points. Now we're at one hundred eighty thousand points, but it's it kind of softens everything up a little. Right. So now, like get the detail in there and I could sculpt it in there but mm -hmm. I, I still kind of have to even in this area right yeah but if of, you just put Dynamesh to a thousand or two thousand like you'd you'd get that detail you could but the thing that I find is like let's say I Dynamesh to a thousand boom, boom I can get the detail but now if I want to do large changes that it's like you know, like like meaning a large change like I'm moving something around mm -hmm. i find it to be more difficult whereas if i'm using something like this i can kind of it feels like i have a lower subdivision level i guess is what it like yeah. i'm still working with a lower resolution mesh uh, mm -hmm. overall uh so it's a little easier to control and build up forms for me versus this style where you know to, to add in a new form uh where the mesh is is very dense is a little harder for me. I think that comes from just liking to build things up slow, though. So, like, right. I always try to go one, two, three. And so, for me, this feels like when I do this, I'm already at like three. Yeah. So like, okay, if I want to, I can't step back down. So, I don't know. It's a it's a cool feature that I like, and I've been rolling into my my workflow more recently to mm -hmm. just to just um, visualize. Like if I was going to finalize this design into something else, I would definitely Z remesh, remesh, and kind of go from the very beginning. Yeah. yeah. So do you think that you would now use, so you're basically now going to use Dynamesh less because yeah. Sculptress is taking its place. In some but ways, when, yeah. when would you choose to use Dynamesh instead of Sculptress, do you think? Uh, I would still use Dynamesh to get to the first shape. So like... Block um, yeah, the block out shape, and then maybe afterwards I would do it or I would Z remesh it. Um, because that was the thing I, I, I've never been somebody, I, I know some artists who feel really comfortable just sculpting at like a really high polygon resolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I always I find that my work, my work kind of suffers that way because I don't get the, the building up of forms that I feel comfortable with. Right. It's like I kind of need to limit myself early to make sure I don't skip steps in some ways. So use Dynamesh a little bit less, but but just a different kind of way, I guess. I kind of see Sculptures Pro as just being like Dynamesh in a specific region. Right. Kind of the way I look at it. Fun. I like it a lot. And it makes it for this kind of stuff. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, I like it. So he was asking, yeah, sculptures is op option awesome. Yes, it's an awesome option for sure. But it is, uh, it's something I've just been using not too, too or I've started picking it up somewhat recently. I just like the, the, uh, the look of it, I guess. I kind of like the, and I do this even when I like start from a base mesh. Like, let's say I'm starting from, uh, let's see, does this have everybody? Yeah. So let's say I'm going to start from like this character. Close this off. My workflow is a little different than I think some people because I'll I'll take and I'll stretch this shape like as far as I possibly can. So let's say I want to have these you know broad, 80s shoulder pads of some kind you know, and really long arms, whatever it is, I'll actually come in here and, and turn off the smoothing when I up uh, add subdivision level. So I'll turn off this little button here 
Uh-huh. And then I'll subdivide a couple times and then I'll turn it back on and subdivide so that I actually have a more faceted look. Like I prefer working in like a more plainer style before adding detail. And so I think that's what the Sculptors Pro does is it keeps it low enough that it's kind of like a mix of the two workflows. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. It's fun. I like it. Yeah. And now just sculpting this guy. So cool. I saw somebody ask if they need to know Maya before going to Nomen. You don't. That's no, definitely not. Yeah. So people get into Nomen just with, you know, who have zero 3D experience. So mm-hmm. I think that's part of it being a long program is you don't need to worry about having experience in 3D at all. And so right. it's okay if you, as long as you have, you know, the fundamentals and, uh, you know, uh, art background, even if it's in a different medium, like drawing, painting, sculpture, whatever, then, you know, the tools have gotten to the point that, uh, you know, it is realistic for us to be able to teach you 3D in the length of the program, which is long. Our program is longer than a lot of other places, meaning that it's, you know, two to four years. Um, and, uh, but Nomen's had that portfolio requirements since we started full-time programs in 98 as meaning that you could get into Nomen with just a drawing portfolio. Um, so yeah, I think if you're playing with Blender, uh, because it's free, that makes sense. Blender or Unreal or, you know, tools like Maya do have more affordable student versions now, but they aren't free like Blender. So I think, you know, sticking with affordable tools when you're getting started and trying things out makes total sense, you know. Don't worry about things like Maya or Houdini. You know, those are more pro tools, meaning that they're used more in a professional setting and and Nomen will teach you that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Are we only in LA? Yes, we're only in LA. We do not have a school in San Diego. We go to San Diego for Comic Con. Mm-hmm. Does Nomen teach 3D artists the concept and matte paint? We have a lot of design courses at Nomen, a lot of 2D fund, fundamental courses from figure drawing to color theory to visual structure to uh, character design, creature design, so forth. So design is a big part of the curriculum at Nomen, not just software. Mm-hmm. And even in the software classes, design is a big part of those classes as well. So I know I'm still looking at a sphere, but that's because I'm <laughs> answering questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're good. But I can move the sphere left and right as I answer questions. As you answer them, yeah. Uh, if any of your students want to make a short film on their own, what would you advise them to do? Uh, if they are at Nomen, I would say don't make a short film. If you're on your own, then obviously making a short film is fine. But there's no reason to make a short film if you're trying to, uh, if you're at Nomen as a student. Um, so making shorts implies that you want to be a director. Nomen is not a program about becoming a director. It's about becoming a production artist. So making a short that has a beginning, a middle, and an end in the story and all that stuff, you know, that can become a huge distraction and a huge time suck And uh, while you're learning the tools and still slow. And so I think that there have been some group projects where students might work on a shot together, you know, something that's five seconds long or 10 seconds long. But an actual narrative short with a beginning, middle, and end um, is not how Nomen's curriculum is, is structured. You know, we're focused on, you know, you want to get a job as a modeler, texture artist, lighter, rigger, animator, effects artist, compositor, matte painter, games artist, et cetera. And none of those skill sets and positions require your ability to direct a short. Fair. I'm going to enroll in some online courses of an intermediate level experience in Maya and a good grasp on ZBrush and Unreal. I was wondering where I should start, which course to start with. I would talk to admissions uh, with a question like that because that's very specific to what you want to learn. Yeah, I was uh, say, what do you want to learn is the real question. And you know, admissions can guide you on that. We have a lot of people who take individual courses who aren't full time who will put together like a series of courses that they might want to take over the course of a year or two, you know, like one class a term as opposed to five, like a full-time student. 
where you can basically take classes in an order that will get you to the skill set that you want to develop, you know, in case you really just want to focus on effects or just want to focus on texturing. All right. Am I going to sculpt or am I going to play in my... <laughs> Uh, somebody was asking about anatomy. I don't know what that word is, though, anatomy. It's some other type. Yeah, I saw that. Too. What was that word? I think it's off my... Yeah, it's Let me off find my it. Screen. It came up twice. Right. So let me show. I think bear anatomy. Oh, Ursa. Like you're talking about earth, like bear anatomy. Um, I think that's what that is. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't I'm, know that word. Yeah, I don't. I'm not necessarily a an animal anatomy expert. I know some, you know, a, a good amount of it, and for comparative anatomy and stuff like that. But uh, I don't, yeah, I'm definitely not a an expert there by any means, Ooh, I like the head being smaller. Mexico. Hello. Hello and welcome. Sometimes like when I like to uh, just kind of veg out and like zen out while I'm doing a sculpt, I usually sculpt anatomy studies or but I kind of find that as being kind of a fun, relaxing exercise. So, but not a lot of bear anatomy. Hello from Germany. Hello. Hamburg. I've never been to Germany. I would love to go to Germany one day. You? I've been to Frankfurt. Yeah. I went to Frankfurt and it's it though. The Christmas markets in Germany are the best. Yeah, yeah, they're cool. They're they're outside markets, um, a mold wine. It's a great time. Big fan. This is turning into like a killer croc sort of. Oktoberfest, definitely. Never been to a full on Oktoberfest either. I've been to Big Bear once. I have a big one up there, but I've never done, uh, never done like one overseas. It'd be fun to do. I'd love to do that. Just remember a lot of sweet Caroline for some reason was being saying. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that was that seems to be the Oktoberfest song, or at least it was there. But uh Neil Diamond? Yeah. A lot a lot of that. That's funny. I went to Neil Diamond's house in high school. Oh, okay. My cousin went to high school with his son. Mm -hmm. And for Fourth of July, uh she, uh, the reason I spent 4th of July, she's a few years older than me, so I was probably like 16, 15. She was probably like 19. And she's like, oh, we're going to go pick up my friend, I don't remember his name, at his house. And I didn't know who he was. And she's like, oh, it's Neil Diamond's son. I'm like, what? So we went there. Uh, his dad wasn't home. We were only there for like 20 minutes just to pick him up. Mm -hmm. But we uh, went into his bedroom, and over his bed was this massive poster, like, six by six feet wide of Neil Peart at his drum set. 
Oh, hell yeah. Rush. This yeah. huge poster of Rush. <laughs> and uh, so he was a drummer and was like super into Rush. And it's just funny, like, that is just, you couldn't get more different from Neil Diamond yeah. than, than Rush. Yeah, yeah it's, it's so, definitely hard to. Oh, really? Yeah. It said Neil first, and I thought it was going to be like a picture of Neil Diamond. That would have been interesting too. Yeah, a huge <laughs> picture of dad. Yeah. yeah. Who you look up to? I think when you sculpt, as we were kind of referencing what we were talking about earlier, you like to sculpt at higher resolutions, right? Or do you like do you use Dynamesh or Spheres, or it looks like you're Dynameshing now? I'm just Dynameshing now, but uh, I don't think I have much of a preference, to be honest. Oh, really? Not really. I mean, I think it would make more sense for me to be at a lower res right now than what I'm using. So I just, just kind of go with it and like don't fret over no. it too much. No. Yeah, I think I mean for making overall changes, clearly having less subdivisions is smart. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody was asking about a link to an anatomy course. We have an anatomy course uh, on our upcoming or I guess our, our classes that start next week. Uh, but you could contact our admissions team or our recruitment team, and they can help uh, find you the, the link to the anatomy course or figure drawing courses. Another really great way to learn uh, anatomy is figure drawing because you're drawing the figure. So it's a really good way to start, like, you know, understanding what the muscles are and the shapes are and all that kind of stuff. Somebody was saying to come to the the Ukraine. I've never been to the Ukraine. That's where Danny is right now. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he got there a few days ago. So Danny, who runs the Nomen Workshop, yeah, he, his wife is from Ukraine, and so uh, they're going to spend the next five months there. It's cool. Yeah, so he... Uh, well, her mom is uh, hasn't seen the twins, and then he hasn't seen his family in Sicily for a little while. So they're gonna hang out in Ukraine and then head down to Sicily. Which sounds like, nice. Yeah, it sounds like a good time. But we're getting there right as things are warming up. Mm -hmm. Got a question from YouTube. Somebody says they're making their first show reel. It's focused on hard surface modeling, and you're also doing texturing on the side. Uh, when I have finished a model, I'm doing a turntable render. Should you? It sounds like you're asking, should you show texture, clay renders, and wireframe renders? Should you also do an environment for your models to show them off in a different scenario? Uh, a lot of things in that question, I guess, but. The first thing that I would say is if you're going to be a hard surface modeler, uh, you definitely want to show off your wireframes and you definitely want to show off what the models look like just as the models, right? I guess it, which we would call a clay render. Uh, so definitely have those two. Um, I would only show textures if you want to do textures and plan on doing textures. And if they make the model better, Meaning like if you're at the point where, you know, sometimes you're better at modeling versus texturing or vice versa, if the textures are great and they make your model look better, show them. If they don't, don't show them. Uh, and then you're asking if you should make an environment, same kind of thing. If you make an environment and it gets too big, that may be taking away from the current project you're working on, especially as this is your first show reel. Um, and, you know, I think one thing that I caution people of is, is don't, don't make the people who are going to be reviewing your portfolio ask too many questions about when you apply. So if you're saying, you know, uh, I want to be a hard surface modeler, but now you have a lot of environments in your portfolio, um, that might confuse them if they if you're an environment artist or a, a hard surface artist. So just be very clear of what you are wanting 
to get your job, your first job for. So it doesn't hurt to have textures. It doesn't hurt to have environments in there, but make sure that it's all up to the, at least the quality of what you're, you're really trying to show off, which would, in this case would be your hard surface models. So focus on that first, focus on the things that you want first. Let's see if you've got any questions. So oh, thank you for posting the, the moderator for posting the forms. You can fill those out to get in contact with admissions and they can help you out with any classes, uh, requests for programs. If you have any questions about Nomen there, we can obviously answer them now, but they can have much more one-on-one -on -one, you know, question and answer and, and help figure out what you want, whether it's full-time program or individual course or portfolio. Uh, question about what at what point do you guys ideally make subdivision levels throughout the figure sculpting process and how many do you usually make? Um, for me, it's a variable choice. So it's it's I only make as many subdivisions as the model needs. So if I really you know, need to, then I will. When I say when I mean need is like if I zoom in pretty far here, you can see that this area here is uh, kind of faceted. So if I wanted to add more details, obviously I need to go up a subdivision level, but you'll notice that on mine over here, I don't have them there right now. So I don't build them or add them until I really, really need them. Um, kind of the way that I work. Alex, do you have an opinion on that? It sounds like you're more flexible with it. Sorry, repeat the question? Uh, about subdivision levels in ZBrush. Like, is there a point, yeah. is there a certain amount that you look for? Is there a certain time that you look to add them? I mean, I add them as I need them. So if I run out of resolution, I'll add another subdivision level. So, but that's really once you kind of get the detailing. So like yeah. in the beginning, it really doesn't matter. But once you get to the point where I need to sculpt an eyelid and I don't have enough resolution to sculpt what I need, then I'm going to divide. Um, and uh, so I have divided up to, you know, a hundred million before using HD geometry. And that was more mm -hmm. for like a terrain, like, because I just, it was a big terrain and I needed a lot of detail. I know like Chris Costa with all of the crazy skin pour detail he does in his yeah. stuff, uses HD geometry a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, you know, divide to what you need. Cause you also have to realize that like, what is your end goal? Like if your end goal is to get it out of ZBrush and into Maya, mm -hmm. then you have to realize like, well, if something is, if the highest res map that your renderer can support is an 8K displacement and you only want to have one 8K map for your model, mm -hmm. then 8192 8, times 8192 is about 64 million. So you're, there'd be no reason for your mesh to be more than 64 million polys. Yep. It's that kind of stuff, you know? So, but if you know that you need to do a 4K render panning up the body of your character, Mm -hmm. like Godzilla right. in a movie and every square inch of that character needs to be able to be seen up close then that's when like you're going to need to subdivide the hell out of that thing and, and sculpt so but for personal work you got to be careful putting that much detail into something because people are just going to see your reel they're only going to see that model for a few seconds so you know I, I would be careful doing something that only look that looks beautiful as like a 16k render for print but somebody's mm -hmm. going to see it at 720p on YouTube as your reel. You know, it's like you might waste a lot of time where you could be moving on to other projects. Yeah, I think they, that the point you made is perfect there. I was going to show some 3D print stuff, that's some small stuff, is what is your goal and what's like the final way that it's going to be viewed, right? If you're going to view, like, like I'll put something on screen right now. So if I have this little miniature, as you can see in my hand, it's it's tiny, right? This is a, a Warhammer size or D&D styles mini. So it's like 25 millimeters. The amount of polygons that you need for this, right? As the detail is here, you can see the detail, but I don't need a million, multiple millions of polygons of detail there. So even what I have like on, on screen over here, right, where it's, this if this is like I'll, I'll even maximize this really quickly so you can see but imagine this character is going to be uh that same size of a miniature on your screen it's probably going to be this big 
So you don't need to add all of the details. Like I don't need to go crazy here. Like the de the amount of detail, even though this is faceted and on only, you know, two hundred uh, and fifty thousand polys, is still more than enough for what that that um, output would be. So it's really dependent on uh, on what you what you like. I think I like this setup more, by the way. This one at the bottom. I think you get a bigger, bigger full screen so you can see the buttons. Uh, but yeah, so it's a good question, but it really, it really is one of those. It's dependent on what you want to do with it, right? Are you wanting to, are you wanting to do a 16K print? Is it a full size thing in VFX? Is it a small 3D print? Like, what's what's kind of your goal? So it's hard to say, but it's a good, good uh, question. Um. Yeah, good question for sure. It's a hard one to answer because it's so dependent. Maria asked if I'm a generalist. I am definitely a generalist, um, meaning that I just, you know, know a little bit about a lot of different things. So, um. Yeah, like that project I was showing at the beginning, you know, there's modeling and texturing and shaders and lighting and rigging and animation, compositing, tracking, like there's, you know, sound, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that would be the definition of a generalist is just somebody who does a little bit of everything. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're like the best at any one of those things, um, but you can get by. Mm -hmm. Which in production uh, for smaller shops is really useful. That's super useful. I mean, just looking at your project, it's like you uh, modeled, textured, rigged, animated. Whether you used you know other programs to assist in that, you, you still mix them all. But I still had to know how to slow down animation and change curves and cycle with offsets and tweak mm -hmm. it. And I had to delete the animation on the legs and lock them down. And like, you know, like I still had to play with animation tools. Yeah. And then you comped it, you did the audio, you know, you render, you like lighting, a little bit of everything. You know, I think that's a, it's the way that you can make whatever you want. Right. If Rather you want to do just personal work, you know, like for me, 3D has always been something that uh, I was also wanting to make my, you know, like I went to art school for illustration, you know, meaning mm -hmm. like I wanted to make narrative kind of images that, you know, um, and therefore I kind of have always wanted to know a little bit of everything with 3D as opposed to just modeling or, but that's me. Like we've had, I know many people who really are, specifically passionate about a specific thing, meaning they love to animate and that's what they want to do. And they're not really that interested in other stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's also very normal. So I, I'd say you got to follow what, you know, excites you. Mm -hmm. I agree. What kind of, are you just searching for shapes right now? Or what kind of things are you looking for? Uh, I don't know. I'm just, uh, since I'm not starting with a drawing or anything, I'm just mm -hmm. kind of seeing if I see anything that I like so that I'll go in that direction. Right. So yeah, I think I'm kind of like, Sometimes this goes quick because I see something early. Yeah. And, and it's, and then sometimes it goes slow because I'm like, nah. Not that one. Yeah. You know, like this is a time where like I definitely wouldn't want to divide higher, higher and start doing any details or anything because I want to be able to just, you know, move things around and change proportions and all that kind of stuff. So. Mm -hmm.
Right. Deciding what I want to do with this. Do I want to like keep taking this further? I jumped into it being like, oh, I'll make this for a little bit. And now I'm like, what do I want to do with this? <laughs> It was pretty cool that I was able to take that character I made and throw it into the auto rigger and have a rig yeah. character animation on it. Like that's that's awesome. That's something I could also do is just give him a really really simple body and just auto or you know Z mm -hmm. remesh, throw it in the Mixmo and have him do goofy stuff. <laughs> that's a good question. I guess I have because I haven't played with Mixmo too much. Uh, most of the animations I see are pretty goofy. Is there stuff that like is more obviously your walk cycle was more general, but it was like what's like the percentage of stuff that's in there, I guess? Is it like there's a lot of stuff in there, but you know, that doesn't mean much of it's gonna work for you know, something specific you're looking for. But mm -hmm. so you know, I mean, I haven't used it all that much. There's tons of clips, but in general, from a production point of view, obviously, you're just going to have your own mocap set up, right? You know, and which is why a lot of studios like Blur have their own mocap stage and mm -hmm. get what they need. So, um, but you know, there are a lot of tools out there to that allow you to edit motion capture data and layer, you know, hand animation on top of motion capture data. You know, I think if I was really going to get into wanting to work with motion capture, I'd probably uh, go and get one of those Rococo suits. Those look kind of cool. Yeah, I keep seeing like ads for that. I think I clicked on one and it keeps showing up. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm seeing ads for them constantly. So they're definitely, uh, I never, I mean, they just popped up spontaneously. Yeah. We're having like, I've been seeing a lot of. It looks cool, though. Uh, yeah, for sure. Let's see. Look at this. We got a 3D printing question. Uh, does printing high resolution 3D models take a lot of time more so than low resolution models? Uh, the quick answer is no, uh, but I'll explain a little bit further, I guess. Um, Let's see. So the processing of a file will take longer. Think of it like rendering. It'll take a lot longer if you are doing it on a high resolution file because uh, you, there's more data to, for the program to deal with. So loading and saving and doing some of the, the things that you'll have to do. But the actual printing of a file uh, more takes, takes time based on the size. So if it's bigger, meaning the footprint of it is bigger, it doesn't matter if it's six polygons, eight polygons, a thousand polygons, or 20 million polygons, uh, because it's it's just printing a single uh, layer at a time. So if you think of it, the way that I, I had it explained to me, which I really like quite a bit, is uh, think of it like ink on a paper, on like a traditional inkjet or traditional paper printer. Um, and what the, the printer does is it takes all of the, it, it analyzes your model top to bottom and you orient which way you're going to lay it down on the printer and it's going to slice it into a thousands of slices. And so it basically does each individual layer. And again, going back to the ink analogy, wherever there would be your model uh, would be black ink. It would just be 100% black and where there's not your model, it would just be white. It would be paper. And so... Uh, it's really based on that footprint, on the amount of sizes. It's not. It doesn't really have at that point have to do much with the the polygon count in any way. So, uh, only on the processing side, you know, whether you're uh, some of the the tools that you use to slice a model, like I can just open up one of those really quickly, um, can take a lot longer depending on what you're, you know, you're trying to to do, just because it's loading files and stuff like that. Justin says it just really wants a better posing tool in ZBrush. Yeah, the, they have the Z Sphere rigs, but I, I've never really used them. 
personally. Let me load up something though. That's if they had IK and VRush for posing. No, oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah, that'd be super cool. That seems like that's been around long enough that that wouldn't be very hard for them to add. Yeah. To be able to look at the Z sphere rig at least as an IK joint chain and lock mm -hmm. the feet onto the ground. All right, I'll go through the process here of, of how we would we would print what we have right now. All right, so I have this. I'm going to put myself on this screen so you all can see a little bit better. Hide this thing at the bottom so you see us. So we have a, a model here. Uh, what you would need to do for all the for the people asking three D question print three uh, D print questions uh, is you need to make a your model watertight. What that means is any open edge like this, where there's it's basically not it's not one mesh that's all wrapped around. You need to seal that off. And so what you have to do is you can DynaMesh it, you can do closed holes, you can do that in Maya. It doesn't really matter, but you need to make sure that there's no open meshes here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to save this whole project before we move forward. And I'm going to split the lower subdivisions that I have. So I have two Z tools here, one that's here and one that's here. I'm going to take this, I'm going to say split it in because I think I should have some hidden ones. Okay. Lowest subdivision level. We'll just make this easy. Delete lower. And we'll just even just delete hidden. That will be a little easier. So now there's no more topology here. And so what I'm going to do really quickly to, to make this watertight is I'm going to just DynaMesh this. If I DynaMesh it right now, it's all going to get soft. It, so this is going to take, uh, this isn't what I want. So I need to DynaMesh this at a much higher resolution. Might want to turn on project. That seems like it's pretty good. And now you can see what DynaMesh did, which is it capped those holes. So this is like the number one requirement that you have to do is to do this kind of stuff uh, before you can export it. Otherwise, the printers won't read them at all. But now I have this and I have this. Uh, I'm going to, to, these aren't too bad, but if they were larger, I would probably lower the polygon counts. Uh, for example, uh, I'll load up a tool that I was using the other day, so you can also see this. So this is uh, in the IG88 print I had I did a week or so ago, and so this is a ten. This piece right here is uh, ten million polygons just for this. And so you can see what I ended up doing is I closed it. The inside has some pieces where I've welded them all together. And it's also one solid DynaMesh object. And then I also created some booleans here for the head and for the uh, rest of the torso so that I can eventually add the legs and the, the arms and all that stuff. So I've keyed, this is what this is called when you key something so that they stick together. What that means is, as this rotates, we'll slow on some of these pieces. There we go pull this off that those two pieces will go together so that I can take the head and I can do it you know, on and off. So this, in this instance, is where I would be uh, decimating this specific piece because it's just way too many polygons. Uh, 10 million polygons for just one piece is way too much. So I try to keep them under a million, under 2 million individually. So we'll take, go back here, go to our Z script or Z plugin. We'll pull this off and just hit We'll put it on this side so it's all on one menu. Goodbye menu. Uh, decimation master. This piece won't take too long. 1.2 million is not too bad. Pre-process, you'll see the line kind of go across at the top. It'll take like a couple minutes or so to do this. And as soon as that's done, I'll hit decimate current. You can play with the settings here. By default, it goes to 
twenty percent of a million is roughly two hundred thousand, so or it is. But I have one point two million. So what I like to do is actually set this distance, the actual number of polygons it is. So like if I want this to be a hundred thousand polygons, that is a four percent of what it was. And now I can see when I do this what the the model looks like, and I can tell you I'm losing a little bit of detail. So I'll just keep going up in this number until it no longer looks like it's losing detail. So that might be somewhere around 300,000 polys for this piece. And that feels good. Then what I'll do is I'll take the same thing in here. This one's only 150,000, so I don't actually need to decimate this. We'll be fine. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to merge visible. It's easier. There's other ways to do this, but this is the easiest way to just make it a separate thing so that I now have this mesh here. So I'm not necessarily going to dynamesh this all together, even though you could, but um, I don't need to in this instance. Uh, somebody's asking in the Twitch chat, how did I solve the strap on IG-88, which was here? Uh, you, you'll notice that I basically took the strap and I merged it into the body. There is some gaps you can see like in here, but anywhere where it was floating off too much, I just either grabbed the middle of the strap. So I, I took the, the back of it and I masked it and I pulled it out. And then I just merged it all the way along. So you can see this whole area right here is uh, merged into the body. So I just dynameshed it into one big piece basically. And I did that with anything that was sticking off too far. So I just kind of merged merged things and then pull pieces of, if it's a back face, you know, almost like this, this little pop socket. But I kind of pull this out and uh, stick that to the, the surface that it needs to be stuck to. All right, so we got this. At this point, I just exported this as an OBJ. Export. You can have this as whatever your file name is. That's on my other monitor, so I'll show you that in a sec. And I'm using an Anycubic Photon Mono X, which is what's behind me here. So that's what we're using there. Uh, and so this can use a lot of different slicing programs. Uh, I'm using Chudibox, and that looks like this. So we'll open this up in a second. Uh, somebody was asking, do my keys never fit most of the time they fit because uh i make when i cut them uh i'll have one is smaller than the other so i'm not using the same object to boolean i'm using one that's like basically a male and a female part if you think of it like any you know sockets that you've ever dealt with um the female part should be slightly bigger so that it can go inside that's just how it has to work um and then you can also put some room in there uh inside there if you want to glue it together. I think that's something that people don't think about it if you're going to glue a model kit together is if you leave no room uh, and you put some sort of adhesive, it will it will not fit together in the way you expect it to. Um, so now we're going to go to Chudu Box or Chudu Box, and that's what this looks like. So this is just a, a pretty basic 3D slicing program. This is the bed size. So this is the actual metal tray that the uh, printer uses and it's based on the type of printer you have so when you set this up you choose what type of printer it is the resolution it is what type of resin you want and all that kind of stuff so it's pretty uh, straightforward that uh, you can go in here and you hit open yeah, that's chudu box actually import where is it there we go so here I can do import 3D printing. I just saved it as this. It's going to take a second. You're going to see it's super tiny. So if you want to scale it beforehand, you can. Right. So right now I can click on this, and I can tell you that it's very, very small. I just hit this scale button, and right now I can tell you it's 2.17 millimeters. So it's very, very tiny. I can just change this, and uh, so I'll hit, like, we'll say... 100. Now it's 100 millimeters. You can grab this and you can rotate it. So there's very simple, straightforward 3D manipulation tools here. The higher, res the question that was asked earlier was the higher the resolution, the longer these functions take. So it's not that your uh, printer itself is going to take longer, but it's actually these um, 
processing functions that take longer, the decimation, the manipulating of the files and all that. You can scale these if you like uh, with a, a different type of thing. What I did on the IG88 one is whatever my import was to make sure that they were the same fit, instead of trying to size them in another program, I just remembered this number right here. So the, the scale percentage that I scaled it when I brought it in. So when I brought IG88, IG88 in, I for the size of the print that I wanted it, I scaled it 7,000%. So if every piece that I brought in was scaled 7,000%, uh, it would be done and they would all fit. So there's different ways you can go about it, but again, it kind of depends on what your goal is. If you're making a lot of these things or a single thing. So I can scale this down and we'll say like 50. It's doing it uniformly. So at this point I can prep this to be printed. I'll probably rotate it this way right and i might rotate it a little bit this way and i'll explain to you why in a second and then all i need to do here is i need to build the supports. so i'm using a resin printer uh a, it's an inverted printer which means that the, the the bed is on the top and it dips into a vat of resin some print from the top some print from the bottom some are fdm printers and they do different things so what i need to do here is create the supports. The supports are, you'll see what it's doing is it's creating a raft. This is the basically the base of this and it, you'll see it's making it hover. I'll just hit auto platform or auto supports right here. And you'll see it creates all of this sort of little matrix of supports that print or that this will print first. So when you're actually printing, I'll invert it. This is the direction that it's gonna print, meaning it's gonna like dip into a vat of resin and slowly create this shape. Uh, you can print it hollow, you can do that, somebody's asking. This is really just a test to, to show you how, how the actual software works and what you actually have to do to print something. But yeah, we can hollow it out and I'll show you that in a second. Right now, this would be a solid piece. Um, there's some things you have to keep into account, but I'm not gonna go into those details right now when you start printing with these types of printers. But this would be enough for me to start slicing it so i'll go back to the main function just switching on this little button here and you can hit slice if you want to hollow there's there's a lot of easy things in here there's a dig hole uh this is and there's also a hollow um hollowing is pretty straightforward and a hole is putting a small hole in your object so that the resin while it's being dipped can go fall out of it uh, basically uh, right now if we hollow all you have to do is you hit hollow you say, how thick do you want this? Uh, what type of, of structure do you want to be on the inside? Do you want nothing or do you want it to fill it with a grid so that it can be a little bit more uh, structurally stable? We'll use a grid and you hit start. And it's very simple, you'll watch it do its thing. So you can see it now going through and hollowing the process. That's the grid that it's automatically put inside. And it's just showing you what it all looks like now. So I can drag this slider here and I can see how thin a piece will be. And I'll also see that grid, which is this in here, of the internal support that will be created when the object is printed. So that's how you hollow it. You create a print, you import, and you have supports for it. Then what you do is you hit this slice button. The slice button will bring it over to a new window or a new style. And this is gonna give you some good information. This is gonna tell you the printer that you're printing on. So in any cubic photon mono X, the type of resin that you're using, it's gonna tell you the volume, the amount of resin that you're using, the weight of what your object will be. And then if you have uh, the type of resin, if you tell them how much it costs, it will tell you how much this print itself would cost. So this print, because the resin for these printers is relatively cheap, would cost me 32 cents. Um, and it would take me two hours, 14 minutes, and eight seconds to print it. There's some bottom uh, things here that, that deal with the types of exposure settings. They're kind of hidden under here. But basically, how long is the light curing the UV? Uh, how long is the UV light curing the resin per layer? And this can affect uh, your times. So if you were to come in and say, like, five seconds on this, it'll adjust saying if every layer, which of which there are 9,000, not 9,000, 999 layers, it will print. 
if they each take five seconds to print or to cure, uh, it will take and, and add an additional hour of printing time. So that's all you really got to do. And then you hit save. You hit save and it will print it out into a format that the printer knows. You put that on a USB stick. You put that in your printer and you can hit go. And then you just wait. So it's pretty straightforward. It's not, it's not a ton of work. Um, it's, there's a lot of steps in there and there's definitely a lot of trial and error and a lot of um, like best practices that you kind of pick up or you can learn, but it doesn't take crazy long. This would have, this print would be 50, 50 millimeters, which is probably, oh, I don't know. It's not terribly large, but it's probably double the size of, this is really small on the screen, but it's double the size of what this is. So it's probably just under two inches. So yeah, it's, it's a super interesting, like a, uh, thing to get into, but it doesn't necessarily deal with polygon counts. It doesn't deal with stuff. You can even see here that this is faceted. This model is faceted. So this might show up in the printer. It might not show up in the printer. Um, I think if I was working at like a really consistent scale, I would I would make that part of my workflow, meaning how, how big do I want to um, print objects and it, I can probably save a significant amount of time if they're consistently going to be small because I don't have to do details on everything. So yeah, that's it. Oh, somebody's asking, uh, why did I rotate it? Good question. And thank you for bringing it up. Uh, what you'll notice is that these supports are, are touching the model, right? And they're because they're touching the model, you'll have to break them off. They're the same type of resin that, uh, is attached to the model. So you're gonna have to, to break them off and sometimes they can leave little scars on the model. So what that means is if I remove all of these and I go back into it and I rotate it, uh, sometimes you can have errors when you print an object purely vertically like this. Um, sometimes they will work, sometimes they won't work. But one thing you have to be aware of is, is that I was not aware of when I started 3D printing in resin was suction meaning if there's too much surface uh, and like too much downforce, basically the, the bed can get, or the, the print can get sucked off your printer bed and fall into your vat of resin and splash everywhere, which is really messy and annoying to clean up. And then the second is the, uh, the scars. So if I were to print it this way, we'll see what it looks like there's a couple more pieces going into the mouth. I'm going to have to pull those out. Otherwise it's going to look like he's got these teeth in there. It's also touching uh, the face more. And then if I were to, you'll see like an example of like, I don't want to do this is let's just make sure I'm touching like this one here. Oh. Right. It, this is like a no, no, like I would not want to print this way because now a lot of those uh, supports are going to be on the front of the model where this is where I don't want them to be going because it's going to leave a lot of marks there. So you usually want to try to put it on the bottom or you want to put it on the back or you want to put it on a place where you're not really uh, going to see it uh, because it, it you will see them regard almost, almost every single time uh, you can kind of see them. So... Uh, yeah, that's kind of how it works. Uh, I'm trying to look here. I'll show you one of the ones that I did that was a little bit bigger uh, on camera here. And so what you're seeing here is a print that I did uh, a couple weeks ago from the Jared Krzyzewski stream uh, that I, I merged a bunch of these pieces together and ended up doing a print of this. But what you see on the bottom, I'll try to get close to the camera, is a lot of these little marks. So that's actually where the supports, there they are, yeah, like all those little holes. That's where the supports were attached to this. And so it, it creates those um, scarring basically. And if you're on, you just don't want that on the art part of your, of your design. So just something to be aware of. Uh, yeah, but yeah, good question. Thank you for reminding me of it. Yeah, you can fill them with resin and use a UV cure. Definitely. There's ways, like, as, as you kind of get into this, there's 
ways to avoid, best practices to, to do. Um, yeah. Do I always use the default supports or do I build my own? I've had pretty good success with using uh, uh, Chudubox's medium auto supports. And then I always, I recently have been using this raft at the bottom. Uh, not If you see the raft, you can choose the raft to be a skate raft or a nun. Nun, here I'll show you what that looks like. None won't have that little thing at the bottom. I found that this type is much harder to, to get off of the bed. So I use the, the skate raft versus the no raft. So that's what this is. It gets a little easier so that they all come off in one piece and you can peel it off your bed a little bit easier than you could have before. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's any other questions on printing, but oh, it was the auto supports. That's right. Um, I, I, this one has a light, medium, and heavy setting. I have just been doing medium all. I'm sure I could probably finesse it and remove some of the, the mediums that are on the face or areas and so do it with lights. Uh, on a couple prints, I tested uh, doing alls, alls with lights. You just see they're a little thinner. And all of the test prints that I did with automatic light supports failed. Uh, the supports printed, but the attachment to the actual model itself uh, failed. And so it all every time I printed it, it fell in. So it was kind of frustrating, but is what it is. Uh, you can also open other things in here. So like I'll show you, these are things that we've seen on streams. So I can add multiple things and you'll see that they're actually showing up here. Some are huge and some are tiny. And so like I'll grab this object, I'll scale this and make it, I don't know, uh, smaller. 80. And then we'll grab our gremlin, which I sculpted on stream a while ago as well. And you can hit this layout button and just like auto layout. And you'll see that it's here. You can scale this one up to be, we'll say 50. This will space it out so that it's on your bed uh, a little easier. And you could, like I would need to create supports for this. this. When you get into different types of things, like this is a simpler object, the, the one we sculpted today. Uh, this is a little more difficult because you have kind of a floating piece. So you wouldn't want to rotate it this way because uh, the tail, you'd be having all these supports. So it's it's really dependent on what your, your object is. And same with this, like you probably want it to be slightly rotated. So I would grab each one of these, rotate them to where the supports would be the best for it. And so I might rotate it a little bit this way. And this one I might even rotate, uh, I don't know, maybe more this way. Hard to know. And then I would create supports for those. And then uh, again with the slicing, it slices everything here. So I could we'll just come in and do very quick things, but that one's good. And then this one's Good, doesn't take terribly long. They're not hollowed, but that's okay. We don't need to do that. If I came in here and I hit slice now, it's gonna do the whole project. It's not doing an individual model, I'm pretty sure. So you'll see it's already diagnosed this where I can, I can go down here. You'll see as I, I bring the slider down, you know, it's now 1,800 slices because it's taller. It's not that it's wider, it's because it's taller. And so all of that is what you're seeing on the right is what it will actually be printing. It kind of looks like an MRI scan. I, you can see that those two objects also are not hollow. So they're full. Fully one piece, whereas I think that one's still hollowed, yeah. What if you want to print your model with texture? Uh, you need a resin, you need a printer that, that prints in, in color. Uh, the These ones do not, the Anycubic does not, most of them. Most, you, know, you need to look for basically a specific one that will print in color. Yeah, good questions. Is that uh, figure thing still around? 
Which one? Where you get fingerprints, where you could like print out oh. your World of Warcraft characters and they printed them out in color and pose. I think and... there might be. I know Hero Forge. We've. I think I showed you yeah. Hero Forge a while yeah. ago. Was a cool one where they do that. Um, I know they do color, but I don't know about Hero Prints. Hero Prints was a. Uh, oh, sorry, figure prints. Kind of cool way back when, just for your WoW character. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody's asking, is it necessary to dyna mesh, or can you just go straight to decimation? You can, but it depends on the type of mesh you have. So not always. Um, it's not always just like drag and drop. Depending on the types of errors you have in your mesh, depends and what it's connected to. Like there's, a, it, it's kind of a, a hard answer or hard question to answer right now. But yeah, it's fun stuff. A lot of interesting things to kind of get into, and then you know, for the the people doing it yourself, I saw some questions about, uh, you know, is it safe? Do you want ventilation? I would definitely want ventilation. Uh, I, my office is in my garage, so. Uh, I have plenty of space here to open up a door or a window and be fine with that. Um, but the resin printers, at least the ones that I've used, the Anycubics, uh, the resin is has a definite smell to it. And you definitely want to wear gloves. And maybe if you don't wear glasses or have some sort of eye protection, you do not want to get resin in your eyeballs. So wear stuff to, <laughs> wear stuff to protect yourself. And then a lot of the... Um, a lot of the materials that you use uh, ends up being 99% uh, alcohol. So you don't also likely don't want to have that just on your skin. So wearing gloves and having uh, eyewear of some kind is, is good so that when you're washing off the ret, the, cause when you wash the prints off, you wash them off with the alcohol. And when you clean up the object itself, like when you clean up the printer, you're going to wipe that down with alcohol as well. So, you kind of, there's just a lot of harsh chemicals or harsh smells. So it's not like, like if I was living in like a studio or a loft, I don't know if I would just sit it next to my bed and do a, like an overnight print. Um, there are some water washable ones and some plant-based resins that are available, but um, I, I've only used the water washable one. It definitely smells a lot better, but it's, it's still, um, can have an odor to it. Good questions though thank you people were asking uh earlier i saw what our lighting setups are i am in a garage and so my garage doors are sort of like frosted glass and i'm just using basically natural light and that's it yeah my i've got all my shades drawn so but they're they're not fully opaque so there's a lot of light coming in through the curtains but and mm -hmm. i've got phillips hue lights everywhere yeah it's Philips Hue is exciting. But how many do I have in here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a strip. <laughs> it's so cool to be able to like change the color of the lights with my phone. Yeah. I have another friend who uses those all the time. You also have the, the lighting from your keyboards, like that that red lighting is. Yeah, is but this is, the, this is the there's the Philips Hue strip under. Oh, there's the, a strip there. there. Got you. Yeah. It's when we went to Miguel's place and he had like everything all controlled with his phone with all these. Uh, I was just like, well, I'm gonna have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I want that. Uh huh. deleted the body somehow. That's okay. Have I tried the lychee slicer? No, I have not. I've had pretty good success with this one. I tried using the Anycubics. I guess it's a port of Chudu Box. And um, I didn't really like it. So I did some research and found that one, which I I liked or like a lot more. Uh, just because it's easier to use, it's a lot faster. Um, but I haven't played around with Lychee, and I haven't. There's a couple other ones that I know that are well regarded. I know Form Labs has their own uh, specific one that they use for their software or for their printers. So there's a lot that 
there's a lot you can use. And I think that's the my favorite thing about exploring in the, the 3D print space so far is that it's kind of, it's very like a maker space where there's a lot of people doing a lot of different types of things. And so you can really, you can really get pretty far into like that community and custom customizing stuff. And it's, it's a cool space to be in. It's a yearly subscription, but it's worth it. That's cool. When I worked at Legacy, we used Magix, which was really expensive. Uh, but that one had all kinds of great features, being able to cut and key and slice and you know do a bunch of different stuff like that. That for small, it seems like at least for smaller home style prints, that it wouldn't be as needed. You know, I'm not sending it necessarily to a mold shop right now. I'm not sending it to be some massive thing. Um, but it seems it seems cool that there's just so many options out there. Can you send your models to a three D print ven vendor, and is there a good one you know of slash like? There's a ton of three D print vendors. Um, you know, like we were saying, like there's some that whether you want to do the model yourself or whether you want to download a model, like we talked about Hero Forge, you can pose models there and download them and print them yourself, which is cool. Uh, so I think uh, you, I think you can download an OBJ or an S STL. Be cool. I'll show you that in case, in case you've never seen Hero Forge, it's awesome. Because you can download these. This is just a browser. So I'm going to browser Hero Forge. And uh, you can basically take and, and customize a character here. And when you're all done, like you, you choose a bunch of different settings and a bunch of different things like your pose and you know whatever you want the character to be doing uh, and when you're all done uh, you can buy it and when you buy it you can choose what type of plastic they'll print it for you i think they partner with shapeways but you can do it in bronze or you can also choose this option here which is the green ones which is an stl download um, so you can download it and print it yourself which is pretty great too so if you just want like some quicker things because you want to print a bunch of objects there's fun features that way too. I printed from them before and had them delivered uh, and I like it quite a bit. I've also print stuff from Shapeways which is pretty good. Um, one that I know that was used a lot and I, I don't know if I've heard about it recently was Ownage. Uh, yeah. They had it. Yeah, they were. They must still be around now. I would think so. I think I tried to check them out recently and their site was, was gone or really? Weird. Yeah, something. I feel like there was something they weren't there. But I know a lot of people that have used them and they also uh, did I'm just Googling them now. They have a Instagram page. Nope. I mean, this is printed from nine weeks ago, and it looks like that they've been doing stuff. But they do the, the cool things that they do is they can also do, like you see here, looks like they're also doing molds. Well, they'll do molds and they'll do paint and they'll do the whole you know production of an a uh, product so that you can you know, not have to store it all. So I've I've heard and seen good things about them, but they don't much have much of a presence. So hard to know. I'm realizing that my leg anatomy is rusty. Well, I haven't, I haven't sculpted like a real leg in a long time. Oh, I'm just gonna sculpt these hands. <laughs> <laughs> Brush up on that later.
Yeah, Hero Forge, I think, still owns the design. But that's they're giving you pre-made models and stuff to, to start from, so I get that. I don't know if Shapeways does, though. Finding any interesting shapes? Uh, I'm so slow. Um, getting there. Ooh, okay. I'm, yeah. So, well, I did a quick sketch in Photoshop. Okay. Which is this dude. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then uh, I really should have just gone to uh, these spheres just to block it out. But instead, I'm just messing around with uh, Dynamesh. Nice. So eventually, uh, I use so ZBrush so little, mm -hmm. so it's like I'm so rusty with it. <laughs> so it'll eventually get somewhere. Right now, he's uh, just little blob dude. Right, but it definitely has the uh, like the same style of, or look of silhouette of the sketch. So that's cool. Uh, yeah, it's. When I can yeah. tell, I'm sure I can tell you're like not yet, but it, it'll, it'll get there. Yeah, I think uh, just need to spend more time again because I used to spend a lot more time in ZBrush, and it's just been a while. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's like I can doodle a lot faster than I can doodle in ZBrush because I'm mm -hmm. just more doodling on paper, mm -hmm. which is an excuse. <laughs> But yeah, it's like I see how fast you bank stuff in ZBrush. It's like, damn, that's awesome. I think it's just I've I've always felt more comfortable. Like I I don't feel as comfortable doodling in two D as I do in three D. So we get those questions a lot in uh, the chat. You know, do you need to know three D? You know, when you want to come to Nomen and stuff like that. And do you need how to draw? All that yeah, you know how to draw if you're going to be a three D artist and all that. And you you don't have to. No, there's a lot of people who just go straight to sculpting with clay or ZBrush and, and mm -hmm. skip the drawing part. Maybe not skip it because everybody draws from like when they're a kid, but like they don't yeah. develop it. You know, they, yeah. they choose to develop that part of their brain in, in 3D. Mm -hmm. and I think there's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah, and that's kind of where I ended up. I just feel more comfortable in sculpture. So it's, I'm looking at my hand as reference as I'm trying to talk, but uh, you know, I, I just feel more comfortable sculpting than I do drawing. It's always been a thing that just makes me a little easier. Mm -hmm. I do. I paint over. You know, I feel more comfortable painting over. I think, you know, this is an excuse, obviously, but perspective is the thing that I always struggled with the most in drawing, yeah. and obviously, 3D solves that because it's. 3D, so it's, it has the perspective down for you. Mm -hmm. So if I have like a render, I can paint over the render, or you know, I was always, I was good at shading and rendering in pencil, you know, or in charcoal or in something I could define a shape once it was rendered. But like getting the core shape down was something I've always really struggled with, and so that's where I guess my workflow kind of resolved into being utilizing, I guess, my strengths of you know, good at painting over and feeling more comfortable in, in 3D sketching and using that as the base. But he is asking, uh, yes, we do have clay sculpting. Thank you, Justin, for saying that. We have uh, some traditional clay sculpting classes at Nomen. Uh, we've had them for a long, long time. Uh, but they're really good if you want to. It's also a really great way. They're figure sculpting classes. So if you're interested in anatomy or just learning, you know, sculpture in general or the, the building blocks of how to start sculpting, it's a really great starting point for that. I learned a lot in that class as far as, you know, what to look for. What to look for when you're sculpting versus um, 
kind of just like how, like how to go up steps, I guess. You know, so I think that's the the scary thing that I see people when they when they start sculpting is they don't know how to get to the end result. Like, I think sketching seems more clear for some people where it's you know, draw because you see it in something like drawing books. You know, draw the sphere and then draw the the you know the wireframe or not wireframe, but like you slowly build up the form. And I think sculpting can be a little challenging because the the concept of planes is not super well known. I think in in, it is when you get like more into it, but I don't know. I think that that's that's a good place to learn is traditional clay sculpting. Yeah, what I is, think that before you have to deal are. with the technical side of the brush and three D and all that stuff, just like buying you know clay and just playing with it and studying anatomy that way, I think is a really fun and effective way to get your brain to start thinking that way. Mm -hmm. And clay is something you can get anywhere. It's fun, yep. And all kinds of really good oil-based clays as well, which never dry out. So you can, uh, I don't have any with me actually. I used, I think I just got rid of the most recent one I had, I donated it. But um, I used to have a bunch of monster clay, which is my favorite because it's like a nice consistency, but it's an oil-based clay. So you can have it around uh, in studios I would always request that we have a little bit of clay, uh, even in CG game studios or whatever, so that you could quickly block out a shape or just find another way to explore something or communicate something. I'm the penciler, Josh is the inker. I actually used to be a colorist. <laughs> Back in the dark ages back when photoshop first was used to color comic books totally spider zero is pretty great check out his work yes spider zero simon is amazing he is so good also what's up curdy hope you're doing well hello curdy yes spider yeah he's amazing he's such cool work and he started doing uh, I know he's done it for a little while, but he's started doing ZBrush. Yeah, he's Some actually been making NFTs of a ZBrush yeah. stuff. And some traditional stuff, I think, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Steve Wang. Steve Wang's also amazing. He is absolutely crazy good. Mm -hmm. like, if you ever get to go to Blizzard to see all those mm -hmm. life-size statues, Holy crap, they're amazing. They're so good. They're so good. And because he's done so, all the, and I think at like every BlizzCon, they like were released a new one. And so it would be like, you know, this year's Rainer or Kerrigan or um, I'm trying to think of some of the more, I think the Lilith, I think they had, there was a most recent yeah. one. Yeah, they're really, really cool. I got to go to a studio years ago with Travis mm -hmm. and it was uh, just nuts. It was so yeah. impressive and so cool. Life super size talented. Oh, man. The life size statues. But there I I mean he got into the e brush stuff and 3D printing at their studio as well. Mm -hmm. You know. So a lot of it is obviously hand sculpted and a lot of it is like prints that are sculpted on top of because they would do that yeah. at Oh, giant too they would carve something really rough out of foam from a 3D yeah. print and then put clay on top of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember even bef before printers got really good, we would do uh, resin prints and then the clay sculptors in the, the shop at Legacy would do like the pours. Like they would do the final, final level of detail uh, to make sure that it was really holding up and looking good. I don't know if they still do that anymore, but cool to see like that mixed medium of, of clay and 3D and... Uh, See it all kind of come together in one or a couple pieces is awesome. And I think that's an interesting area that you know is similar. Like it's definitely adjacent and part of you know it's not it's CG yes, but it's not like uh, I think what most people would think of. There's been a lot of Nomen grads that have graduated and worked at Legacy like myself or you know or or different shops like that like ADI or Ironhead and doing 
props and weapons and costumes and characters and creatures for for practical yeah, I effects. Them. I follow them on Instagram and they post some yeah. crazy cool stuff. Also amazing, yeah. That's where a lot of there's like a whole genre of work there that I think is really awesome. Well, I sculpted a buff alien. <laughs> there we go. This is like awesome. the classic, like He Man. You know, like, buff dude, put an alien head on it. I need to lower my air conditioning. It's freezing in here. <laughs> it back. Yeah, no worries. Uh, if anybody's got questions on anything in the stream so far, let us know. We've got 40 minutes left, and I'm just debating if I want to try to do these legs. Back. Maybe explore something else for a little bit. I was having a conversation with somebody about this, but uh, with somebody recently. But when it comes to sculpture, are you additive or subtractive or both? Do you get the shape and carve into it, or do you mm -hmm. get a shape and then build it out? Uh, probably more build it out, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like start with something that's thinner than it's supposed to be, and then sculpt yeah. and then add. Um, what about you? I'm kind of a, I build out. I usually build out. Yeah. And then sometimes I'll, I, I think I was, when I was talking about it, I was talking about, you know, sculpting out of marble, just being yeah. somebody who sculpts out of like a medium, like a marble or a wood, mm -hmm. just how, how difficult that would be. Being able to visualize something inside of a massive block. I know it's amazing. Can't I mean I've never tried it, so I I yeah. assume that it must be so difficult. Yeah. I mean I've seen people kind of do that in ZBrush, like start with a cube and just carve it, carve into it. I've seen people do some pretty neat things. Sure. Yeah. I experiment. Mm -hmm. But I've never I've never tried it though. And I I think my pro my process is like so. And sometimes I'm more adjustive, meaning like I'll have to make a shape and be like, mm, that's not right. I need, I need to move that around, you know, to make the right shape. So sometimes mm -hmm. I just sketch in an object and then and then try to fix it afterwards. But I like I don't know if I could doing something out of that style would be so difficult. Mm -hmm. 
Would you recommend sculpting to get better at drawing? Yes, for yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Even though I don't feel super comfortable in drawing, like I was saying, I do know that my drawings over time have gotten uh, better because uh, I know, like, if you kind of think of it like in silhouettes or something, right? I, I know what the shape I want is after having spent a, a good amount of time sculpting. And so now when I'm drawing, I know what I'm trying to achieve more than before, where it was more kind of an unknown. Um, and when you're working in sculpture, you're working in a medium where you're, you know, rotating around, you're working in the round. And that means that you are evaluating a shape more than just what it looks like from the one angle. And so if, when you start trying to understand what something looks like in multiple angles, you, you know, it, it just kind of gives you a better understanding of what form is and where the forms are going. So absolutely. You can definitely get better at drawing uh, by sculpting. It's time. To bust out the anatomy tools. Hmm. Nice. There it is. Make sure I know what I'm, I don't know where to put you right now, so you're not on camera all the time, but uh, I'll put you right here, I guess. Hmm. Realize that on stream, I don't. I usually put this thing like right in the middle, but I'm like, this is probably right in the way. Can I get it to depth of field out? No. <laughs> You're right here. It should look. At, it should autofocus on your face, though. No. Hi. It's weird. so close. It's like just really likes that shoulder. Huh? Oh, there you go. Hey, there you go. we made it. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, camera loves that shoulder. Let's see if we can get in there a little more. I remember when I was on stream with Jay Field, uh, not Jay Fields. Jay Fields is in the chat. Jay Hill. Um, he had like a nicely. Oh, there we go. Look at this. Get in there. Ah, there we go. Nice foreground object. It's really distracting. Justin, you got one of these from winning best of term. Yeah, he won best term a while ago. Obviously, when going to Noman, I remember. That's awesome. That was that's definitely a good use of best of term money for sure. Yeah, that's for right. sure. This is my weakest. There's some areas of the body where I'm like, all right, I know this pretty well. Like I can probably not fake it, but I can fake it. Like that, I know what's going on there. Like, oh, I, I'm pretty confident in what's going there. Legs, I, I almost always need a reminder of. Yeah, for me, it's like thighs. Like, I'm fine with like the lower leg. Mm -hmm. For some reason, the thigh, I always have to. Yeah, you're like something's something's wrong here. What muscle group am I missing, or what am I? Something. Yeah, off. I don't know what the reason is behind that? It's like I think there's something about like an arm where the anatomy is so mechanically intuitive, like with the function mm -hmm. of a bicep, the function of a tricep mm -hmm. out, but like the anatomy of like the front of a thigh is kind of weird. Like the way mm -hmm. the, to me, like I know that that's just as mechanically function functional as the way an arm is designed, but it seems less obvious than right. Yeah. Like on an arm. I don't no, know. You know, all the muscles are like diving into each other and they're they connect you know all at different places and it's not it's not as simple I mean, so does the arm but it's it just feels less simple and straightforward and even when sometimes when I feel like I've got the shape I'm like that just doesn't look good 
It's not appealing. So I always, it's the one I struggle the most with for sure. How long is a BFA degree at Noman? Three or four years. It's a four year degree. Uh, but if you'd like to take it and uh, take summers off, you can get it done in three years. So it's 12 well, terms. People, if you don't take summers off. It'll oh, sorry. Yeah. Opposite yeah. of that. Yeah. If you don't take summers off, you can do it in three years because we work on a quarterly basis. So if you take, uh, it's 12 terms long. So if you take 12 consecutive quarters, you can do it in three years. Which is basically everybody. Yeah. Very rare for a student at Nomen to take, take a break. Yeah. yeah, it is kind of one of those things where it's once you're in the groove, I think, as well, like you're learning and you're progressing and you're feeling you know, pretty good about how things are going. Uh, it's, it's a done kind of a thing. Like you're, you're so close at that point. usually sculpt with references or with some idea in mind? I try to. Um, what about you? I try to, but sometimes I definitely fall into the, I'm just going to make something and see where it takes me. Often once I do that, I try to follow up after, after like the phase one and then bring references like into the equation. Like if I don't know what I'm doing and I'm just following shapes, then it's like, all right, I should probably bring some reference in here to, you know, make sure that this is working better than just being something I'm imagining completely. Uh, but most of the time I try to. I mean, even if it's just that, you know, like that quick drawing I did just so I have mm -hmm. some idea you know, um, I find that it goes a little, that I'll spend less time going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. So, but I, I also have a tendency, like if I start something to bring it all the way through to like a finished image, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a, a time commitment because of that. And so mm -hmm. like, I don't, I don't tend to like you do a lot of like do a sculpt and never go do it again. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I don't think I've ever done that ever in ZBrush, just sculpt something just to sculpt it and then never open that file again. Not really. Yeah. Really? Oh no. God. I have so, I have so many folders. Sometimes Which I'm like, is, that's, oh, cause that's awesome. But that's sure. because you don't draw. That's because that's, I that's think true. that's because for you it's sketching. That's true. And yeah, that's true. Which is really cool. You know, I and uh, I, I think I need to try that so that I don't see it as something that needs to be something that I'm going to finish and therefore right. it's, it's less important. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's how I look at like doodling. Like I, I can doodle for an hour and never look at it again. And it was just an experiment in doodling and therefore it doesn't matter. And therefore I don't mm. feel pressured and there, therefore it's more fun maybe. Mm -hmm. But once I'm in something like 3D, I feel like, oh, well, I'm going to try and make something that's going to be like a fin. Like, like I see what I'm working on now is like I'm going to sculpt this and rig it and animate it. Right. Well, I you think know, that's, so that's where opposite. I think that's so cool though because like the you're you're really excellent at finishing something and seeing what the end goal is. Where I'm like, 
mm, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this. Like, <laughs> you know, like, okay, this is a thing. It looks fine, but I don't know what to do. The opposite is, so I'm definitely jealous of like your uh, vision and then finishing skills. So that's definitely not my forte. Like, I think, you know, doing all the sound and doing all the maybe the comping and the rigging and like creating a cool image and sequence out of that is awesome that you're able to go through it all, but do it on most of the things you start. It sounds like almost all the things you start, if not everything. I mean, not always. I definitely have experiments that I'm just like, you know, after a little bit, I'm like, man, I don't like this where this is going. So I have, yeah. yeah, saying never is probably not correct. I've done, I have a lot of things that I've done in Maya as as doodles. Interesting. Okay. Nowhere. It's just ZBrush is like your, your starting point for a project, maybe. Yeah. I, I guess maybe that's what it is. But it's hard with these. Uh, I'm still getting used to the streaming thing because, like, my brain's not fully, you know, like I'm. I feel like. Uh, need to just sort of get used to the streaming thing so that I'm doing things in the correct order that I would if I was doing something by myself. Mm -hmm. These legs don't look terrible, so I don't feel too bad about it. Feet, however, we're going to stay these little blocks. Oh, well, maybe not. What are you, because you are seeing this as something that you might rig, animate? Yeah, maybe. I don't want to say, like, I'm definitely going to do that. <laughs> You're not that you said it. Yeah. Like, well, maybe not. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. What do you envision? Do you have an envision, like, do you know what the final product could potentially look like, like now, or is that sort of a discovery for you? Oh, yeah. That would be a, that would be a discovery. Okay. I guess sometimes what I do do with my doodles is um, that was triple word score with do's by the way um, mm -hmm. <laughs> as I save them for later so I'll sculpt something that's like somewhat general mm -hmm. and like almost treat it like a base mesh like I'm gonna sculpt you know like today I'm gonna sculpt this super buff alien dude and then maybe you know the head is separate like I so I kept this piece as a separate thing so maybe if I ever want to put this on another character, like I can do that for a, a different project or a thing. So it's like, oh, you know, I do kind of save it in that way. Right. I think of like my process. Because I want to do some bigger projects. So I kind of got that, that one cast that I'm working on as well. But yeah, I don't know. Interesting watching... Uh, you work on the stream as well because I'm being able to, to see like how you work and how you bring all your stuff into different uh, projects. I think it's awesome, especially all the different software you, that you jump through for like just the one you were showing today is really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's like I said, like I, I only know a little bit of all of those tools, but uh, you don't need to know a lot for basic stuff, you know? So mm -hmm. 
think uh, that's something that's made software less intimidating to me is just being like, all right, there might be a thousand buttons in this tool and it's mm -hmm. okay. I don't know what 900 of them do. Right. Yeah. You know, cause I think I, I definitely felt at the beginning of learning, getting into software when I was 20, you know, yeah. that like, I'm supposed to know what all these buttons do. It'll take forever to learn <laughs> to throw around, you know? Yeah, and then I'll you never hear, learn it. Especially when you hear that people are using, you know, ZBrush and Maya and Photoshop and sure. After Effects, and whatever, then it's just like the, all of those programs are so deep. Yeah. And ultimately it's like, eh, you just learn the part of it that you need for what it is that you want to do. So mm -hmm. don't, don't feel like you really need to know it all. To do every part of it. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, there's all sorts of stuff in ZBrush that I've never used. There's all sorts of stuff in Maya that I've never used. And then the day might come where I need, you know, something that's in a tool that I haven't used, and then I'll learn that tool. Right. You know, I mean, I think Nomen students are in a unique position when they graduate because they've been exposed to like so many different programs and have spent a lot of time in so many. Mm -hmm. So I think like for, certain grads i'm curious like if like the point at which they graduated nomen is when maybe like they had you know the most diverse range of skills hmm. versus later especially for student you know grads who go on to specialize I think that's probably true for somebody like even for me like i got you know i special i knew still know i think the basic knowledge of everything but to do like a full animation would take me longer right than it probably did back then you but i've also you spent a lot of time animation hmm? classes and like you were exposed to all that stuff totally i think i could do it if i if that was like yeah i really want to do this but i definitely I've kind of, you know, with my specialty, kind of focused on that too. So it's kind of interesting. But I definitely think it was one of the, you know, the the broad training was probably one of the best parts of, about Nomen, though, because you, I don't think I would have gotten to the places I got in my career without having that knowledge, because yeah. it's so much more about being able to talk to other people about what they're doing. Like being able to have a conversation, a productive conversation for the product or the thing, whatever you're doing. Um, it's not always just about doing the, the thing that you do, but it's also, you know, in concert with what everybody else does. Yeah. Was Legacy your first job out of Nomen? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Legacy, that was my first job. And I think for me, that was an interesting twist because I thought like, I thought I was going to graduate and go work a, like my, my places that I had wanted, like, you know, before and going into Nomen was like the blur cinematic team or the blizzard cinematic team and being in like a post, but the more animated, but realistic, you know, sort of a cinematic team. And so going to work on, uh, at legacy was a, was a lot of those, like the, the skills that I had were like one-to-one -one for working there you know, character modeling, sculpting, like doing a lot of that is the same, but it was not much of the texturing, not much of the rendering, not much of the, you know, of that stuff, but it was 3D printing and working with actors and working with scans on actors. And it was like a lot of different stuff at the s similar yet different. Mm -hmm. That's why I think I kind of fell in and then getting into design after that, because we were doing a lot of design work at Legacy as well for different characters or for creatures or commercials and stuff like that. So. Similar but different, but That's awesome. that was my first job. Oh, but when you started there, it was it was already called Legacy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was in 2010. I think they changed the name in 2009 or 2008. Yeah, that was a little bit of a, a lot of people were very surprised when they renamed it. Mm -hmm. You know, like a bit now it you know, it's, it's a great name and it makes sense. And, but I think at the time people were a little weirded out. Was there a weird vibe there when you started of people 
disagreeing with the idea of renaming it? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think it was more just about, I think, you know, for most of the people working there, uh, the name was, was, was respectful, right? That it's like, it's legacy. We're, we're continuing that legacy versus, you know, changing the name or keeping the name. So there wasn't a, an issue with it. Okay. I don't know what the, if there was any issues with like rights to the name either or who family. Yeah. I don't know what happened there, but I think that everybody that I was working with was the same people from the, the shop from the okay. web stands shop. And so they all seemed that what I could tell. The owners now are John and Shane. Unchain, Lindsay and Alan. Okay. This is four. Yeah, there's four owners and they all kind of hold different parts. And so Alan does the commercial side. So most of the commercials, if they, they do a, a significant amount of commercial work. Um, like, and I think a lot of it is stuff that people don't necessarily think of because they do, you know, so much puppeteering is a huge element to what they do. So like the Aflac duck, right. is done by legacy, the whole duck and the puppeteering team. And like, that's all their team. So like, and all the other things that if you see, like most of those, uh, commercials for, uh, ad agencies or like the, like some random projects that I worked on was like the the sun costume for jimmy dean right like <laughs> making that that ball sun costume making things for orkin commercials you know when you watch a lot of those commercials like if you go watch any of those ads or any of those things popped up there's so many like animals and dragons and puppeteer things that are or little robots that are kind of walking around that it's uh that all that stuff is done by like like legacy or companies like legacy so it's it, it was really interesting also kind of seeing that because it's like oh this is a you know how like puppeteering is still part of the industry there cool especially being able to watch I, i've always enjoyed puppets i think that there's sort of like a magic to that and uh watching them rehearse was always something i just liked like getting up from my desk and going and watching them rehearse like four or five people controlling one character. Like I'm just the, the, you know, the mouse and I'm just the eyes and I'm just, you know, I'm the actor inside who's the hands. I always thought that was a fascinating part of the process. Yeah. That must've been really, really cool to be around all the time. All of those shops that do real stuff. Mm-hmm. Spectral motion and ADI. Oh yeah, there's tons of them. I mean, definitely from like touring studios perspective, like for people who get to visit studios, mm -hmm. they're always the coolest ones because, like, you know, visual effects shops are just a bunch of computers, right? And then you go to a place like those, and it's just like there's just real stuff everywhere, and it's so, all everywhere. You know, yeah. I think for a lot of us, it's kind of like what we think of when we think of. Mm -hmm. you know, especially those who grew up in like the seventies or the eighties. Yeah. I think it's, and you know, especially I would love to go take a tour of, of legacy after like, or Henson's. Yeah. Justin just said Henson's is also great. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, like, especially I would like, I'd love to take a tour post COVID cause they were the shop that did all the Mandalorian stuff. So like the child and Mando and like all that stuff is there. You know, when I was there, it was the amp suit from Avatar and the Terminators and Jurassic Park. And uh, even when we started doing uh, work with, like when I, my first project, there was Real Steel. And so those were animatronic eight foot tall robots that were just chilling in the shop, you know? So it's like all that stuff is around. It's just a very different experience. Like being able to, especially when you print big stuff, like working with like small minis is great. Like, like the stuff I've showed off today with like miniatures and, you know, tabletop things. It's always fun to do that or making a model kit, you know, a quarter size model kit is fun. But when you print out something or work on something that, that is life size, but the object is like 10, 20, 30 feet tall, 
And so you mm -hmm. print, you know, you print out a hand. I remember uh, printing out a boxing glove for one of the robots. And it was like, I'm looking around for a box I have, but there's nothing, there's nothing big enough, but it was probably like this big, you know, three, two and a half feet long for like one hand of this robot and you're like this thing I've been working in the computer, which is like so tiny, you know, in comparison or a P it, there's like the sense of scale in the computer is so abstract. And when it comes out, you're like, Oh, this thing is massive. Like this, seeing this thing in real life is going to be crazy. Uh, looks like we got a, a recruiting team or admissions or moderating team is posting some links in the chat. So if you're interested in the four year degree or the two year program, those are there as well. And if you want to get in contact with uh, our admissions team, it uh, looks like there's a paper form link there so you can set up an appointment and uh, get you in contact with admissions. And it's always good to, to do that because they're the number one place to start if you're interested for any type of class or program. So. Take a look at those. A lot of superhero work too. I think that's what, it, there's so much super work, superhero work just in general, but I was seeing some pictures. It looks like they're working on like Black Adam and it looks like there's a bunch of other cool stuff going on at Legacy, but suits, all that kind of stuff is always going on in the shops. Suits, so superheroes, robots. Very similar, I think, to you know the CG realm. Mm -hmm. There's always stuff that, that doesn't exist. Making stuff that doesn't exist is you know, kind of the bread and butter. Oh, Justin, you worked on Black Adam. That's awesome. I'm excited to see to see that one. I've been been following some of the casting stuff and trying to figure out, do my sleuthing to see what's going to be about. But excited. Is Black Adam? That's DC. It is, and that's the one that'll be starring The Rock. Sort of in the Shazam, well, very much in the Shazam world. I didn't see that. I heard it was funny, though. I like Shazam, actually, quite a bit. It's a... Uh, Shazam is one of my... I, mean, I think I've said this many times on the stream, I think, but I, say, I, I like the, the B, C, and D tier characters. I've never been an A-level character, mm -hmm. except for maybe Spider-Man. But uh, Shazam is one of those where there's like this kind of classic superhero-ness to him. I think, mm -hmm. I think he was actually maybe, I don't know when he was created, but I'm questioning if he was created before Superman. Very old, but bringing in some of that like classic, classicness to it, but um, a lot of humor because he's a kid, basically. So like alter egos. So it's, it's a fun like setup. Damn as a kid. Yeah, Shazam's a kid. So he's oh, a kid yeah. that gets like the is deemed, I think there's a certain term for it, and I'm blanking on it all right now, but he's deemed like chosen by this wizard who gives him the powers of Shazam, which is S H A A Z A M, which all stand for different things that he the powers that he receives. And so he can switch into that like power, or he can turn it on, I guess, by saying the word Shazam. Got it. So it's sort of this like different than, you know, Spider-Man. It's different than, you know, other younger superheroes because they, he's got like a, it's like big. It's a lot like big meets superheroes is, is what Shazam is. So he's dealing with like adult problems, but he's a, still a, a child a lot of the, in a lot of it. Names of the Greek Gods, I think it was like, oh, I'm going to butcher this so badly what the S-H-A-Z-A-M was, but it was Solomon. I think it's the wisdom of Solomon, the strength of Hercules, something of, the, I don't remember what they all are, but um, 
I'm sure somebody in chat will, will tell me what they were. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's what they all kind of stand for. Achilles, yeah, I think Achilles was one of the A's. There's two A's. I just can't remember what they all are. He's also magic based, so there's all these like weird. I've gone down many a rabbit hole when it comes to like power grids and who beats who in the superhero universes. And mm -hmm. uh, Shazam's up there because he's magic based, whereas a lot of superheroes are not magic. Okay. It's not magic. Good thing. Superman was the first. Thank you, Comics Legend. Comics Legend from YouTube. What does Shazam stand for? Zeus. Yeah, I guess that would make sense for the Z. But I wonder when they were both made. I feel like they must have been some time around the same, created around the same time. Ooh, yeah, Speed of Apollo. I think that's right. Yeah. Wisdom, stamina, power, courage, speed. Okay. Mercury is speed. Oh, okay. So they're all there. I don't remember what they all are, though. I always like Shazam because he's a fun character, too. I, mean, I actually quite like the movie. Achilles' is Courage. Thank you. Wisdom. I think a Wisdom of Solomon. Thank you. Wisdom of Solomon. Strength of Hercules. Stamina of... Achilles, power of Zeus, courage. No. Wait. Atlas. Thank you. Atlas is stamina and speed of Mercury. So what his name is. And all the powers he has. And then there's also a whole bunch of other members of that team as well. Was there a Shazam show in like the 70s or something? I'm sure there was, yeah. I just feel like I recognize it from something other than the recent movie. Uh, I believe there was a Kazam movie starring Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> Definitely not that. <laughs> Different for sure. There was a... Uh, what's it called? The Mandala effect with, I think, Shazam and Sinbad. People think that that's a real uh, movie that seems to have been consistently disproven that Shazam with Sinbad did not exist. It's interesting. Bernstein Bears. Question from Twitch, any updates on campus reopening? Uh, we kind of answered this earlier, but for the upcoming term, we'll be online. Uh, we're just, I think we're all kind of doing the same thing and hoping that, hoping the next term uh, we can open, but there's no real way to know right now. So, Yeah, I mean, if, keep, keep an eye on news in regards to yeah. California and universities, California and colleges, because we have to follow that guideline. And so it seems like... Uh, the rate of vaccination in the U.S. is accelerating. It's amazing. I think I read that we're almost hitting 4 million a day, mm -hmm. which is uh, great. It's it's definitely going faster than I, th I thought it was going to. So does that mean that things are going to be reopening? I mean, they're going to be reopening. Is it going to be 
summer. I wish it was up to us because obviously we all want to get back to campus, but if you get vaccinated, mm -hmm. it needs to say that it's okay. Mm -hmm. Obviously there's a lot of huge universities, all the public universities, the ones that have like 30,000, 40,000 students, UCLA, all those, the UC system, you know, we're looking at those. We just got to keep an eye on what's, what are the protocols? What are the rules? What's safe? You know, so obviously we want to reopen, but you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of factors at play, obviously. Yeah. As soon as we possibly can though. All right, Alex, we've got two more minutes. Oh, I like that crown shape. He's got a little bit of a... I dig that. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it's like doing a doodle is good and bad because I guess by having a doodle, then I kind of am like keep kind of glancing <laughs> at it. While if I didn't have one, you know, I just would sure. be losing along. But uh, but yeah, I, I feel like something kind of slow in ZBrush, it's gotta be kind of boring for people. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's... Look at Josh's screen. There you go. There's not a lot of detail here though. It's just, it's deceiving. <sighs> All right. We are almost done is 4.59 here. I think that's probably going to get close to wrapping it up for us. I'm going to save my file before I say that and jinx myself. Uh, that yeah. was just posted in the chat, but we have a upcoming stream this Friday. So in two days from now, uh, a Nomen alum, Jason Michael Hall, will be showing off some of the 2D style animation he's been doing at Blender. The work he's been doing is really cool. It's like very almost... Uh, I don't know what the right style to say it is. It's not necessarily anime, but it's it sort of feels cartoon-esque in like a, a specific way, like drawing over. I believe he's using a lot of grease pencil, which is a cool feature within Blender. Um, but yeah, check that out. That's going to be this Friday. I'm going to click on this. Can I show this? There we go. Well, there's a long link in there, but that's the, that's the link. So go check that out. Uh, that'll be this Friday. Uh, so check that out. Uh, if you want to follow uh, Alex on Instagram, follow him at Alex, or sorry, at Alvarez underscore eight times. Yeah, underscore, 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 underscore. Yeah. I didn't want to say it that many times, but that's what, that's what it is there. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, uh, follow at Droids for Sale. And then of whatever platform you're watching us on today, uh, like, subscribe, or follow so you can get um, notifications when we go live because we have lots of events. We usually... We have at least one event every week, which is this one. So we do this from 2 to 5 Pacific time every week. Uh, but we also do Friday streams like we talked about with the Blender stream. We do Thursday events where we'll be having an upcoming uh, stream on the making of the of Liberator from Netflix. Uh, so we're going to have a lot of cool stuff coming up. So like, follow, subscribe so that you can know when that's happening. Um, all right. Anything, anything else? Uh, no. That's it. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for watching. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll see you next time. See you. See you next week. Totally. Right. Bye, everyone. Later. <laughs>